Joey Janela. I think we're live, man. AW Dynamite tonight. COVID edition. Lance Archer tested positive for COVID-19. Major changes happened. Six-man tag no longer. John Moxley defends the title, the AEW title, against Eddie Kingston. Logic. I love it. Mr. Brody Lee defends the TNT title against one Orange Cassidy. Miro makes his in-ring AEW debut. And the return of Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes is back. And he's seeking that gold. The best tag team on Wednesday nights is once again live on the number one pro wrestling podcast for all AEW. This is Off The Square. going on guys thank you so very much for joining us right here on off the script i am of course the master of ceremonies the million viewer man jd from new york and my good buddy here jesse what is going on man man what's going on how you doing out there in uh, in the ny man everything is good bro everything is good fall is in the air I got a nice Moscow mule sitting to my left. A couple, actually. And we are going to get down to business. This is off the script, guys. Thank you so very much for joining us here tonight. We got a lot to go over. Plenty of news in the world of AEW. Plenty to talk about tonight with Dynamite on TNT. Quickly, let's run through what the show consisted of tonight. Lance Archer oh, testing bro. positive. Bro, slow down, slow down, slow down. What happened? We had a we had a death in the family, man. Come on. What are you talking about? What's going on? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I was gonna get to it. It's in the notes. It's in the notes. I, I wanted no, to man. go. Family first. Family first, man. Come on. Jesse is wanting me to obviously. Wish condolences to uh, the Laurinaitis family. Uh, I was going to go. Oh, it's in the fucking notes here. Believe me. Um, but I woke up to the news this morning of Animal. Animal passing away. Animal of the Legion of Doom. Um, clearly, big part of our childhood. No matter who you are. No matter where you are in the pro wrestling realm. I think everybody, everybody knows of the Legion of Doom. Uh, they weren't my favorite tag team personally, but I mean, if you're talking about the greatest tag team of all time, I, I think everybody that is a fan of pro wrestling mentions the Legion of Doom being number one or number two. It's always it's always a back and forth between Legion of Doom and and Demolition. I was a big Heart Foundation guy. I was a big, uh, believe it or not, Money Incorporated guy. But Legion of Doom, man, nobody nobody 
came across like them. Uh, the charisma of both Animal and Hawk, they both complemented each other like you wouldn't believe. It's a rarity to find two guys that actually gel together the way that they did as far as uh, a tag team goes. And you talk about powerhouse, man. When you want to talk about powerhouse tag teams in the world, in the history of pro wrestling, I, I don't think anybody really has even come close to doing what they did. You know, the Steiner brothers had that power, but they never had that charisma. And the Legion of Doom, you know, I think you said it in my Twitch stream earlier, Jesse, the greatest tag team is once again reunited, you know? Both Hawk and Animal reunited. Uh, my condolences go out to the Laurinaitis family. Um, 2020 just proves to continue to be uh, literally the worst year ever. And uh, I was sad to hear that today. And my thoughts and prayers go out to the Laurinaitis family. Any any fond memories of the Legion of Doom, Jesse, from uh, from your end? Yeah, man. I grew I remember. I remember when I started watching wrestling in the NWA days and the WCW days, man. And... um. The the Road Warriors were just the tag team to beat, you know. And no matter what promotion they went to, what show they were on, the Road Warriors came out, and it was, you know, something was about to happen. I mean, you know, and it might sound weird to say that, but so many matches now, you know, you see these days, nothing really happens all the time. Sometimes it's just by the book, get this match out of the way. Legion of Doom came to the ring, man. Something was going down. And um, I remember with them um, getting me is when I, just the thing was whenever they came out they were always announced as being from Chicago. And back then, you know, in the in the late '80s, early '90s, you didn't get too many too many big stars out there from Chicago. And Legion of Doom came out from Chicago and you know they kicked everybody's ass. You no, know, that was that was my hometown team. So I remember rooting for. Legion of Doom for a long time, man. And, um, yeah, when Hawk passed, it sucked. You know, we all knew about his demons. Um, as far as I know, we don't really know what happened to what Animal yet. But, um, he's only 60 years old, man. He was way too young. Yeah, the funny thing um, is, he actually, he actually Facebooked, uh, uh, like, um, an update. He had a status update on Facebook where he was wishing his wife a happy anniversary or happy birthday or something along those lines literally yesterday. And wow. I, seen some, I seen some texts going around on social media today that he was in good spirits. He was, he was full of life literally yesterday, last night, sending texts. And then everybody wakes up this morning to find out about the news of his passing. My buddy Keith texted me and he sent me a screenshot of the uh, Wikipedia page, and he sent me the screenshot along with, is this real? And I was just opening my eyes. I'm like, holy shit, what the fuck's going on now? So obviously I tune into Twitter, and then I see WWE sent something out. I see uh, the official statement from the family, and yeah, it was true. They already had uh, put that he had passed on his Wikipedia page. So I don't know what the cause of death is. I don't know if he was struggling with anything, but... You know, the last thing that we wanted to wake up to today is another death in the world of professional wrestling. And yeah. it, it's just, it, one by one, all of our childhood heroes are just uh, just going away. It's quite sad. It's quite yeah. sad. I don't yeah, know. yeah. I'm seeing in the chat a lot of talk about um, Gail Sears, too. I mean, obviously, yeah, rest in peace, Gail Sears, too. Um, you know, it sucks. This is a, but this is a wrestling podcast. I was trying to, you know, minimize the, we're going to be here for four hours all night talking about the legends that passed away today, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Rest in peace, Gail Sayers as well. It is, uh, I mean, hopefully maybe I'll have something, some, some form of news when I, uh, when I record the show this weekend about what had happened with, uh, with Animal. But again, you know, everybody here in the chat Jesse and I, my condolences, Jesse's condolences go out to the Laurinaitis family and anybody that knew Animal and Hawk and were close personal friends with them. You know, our thoughts and prayers are with you guys as well this evening. Tonight's show, Jesse, what'd you think of the show? Tonight we had uh, Brody Lee and Orange Cassidy for the TNT title. I thought that was a very good match. Uh, I do not like the Dark Order being out there, but I get why they're there. I get the fact that they're a heel faction. I just... It's just rinse and repeat with these factions. 
We'll go over that a little bit later. But we have Brody Lee defending the TNT title against Orange Cassidy. Cody Rhodes makes his return to the company after five weeks away. We had Lance Archer testing positive for COVID-19. He made an official statement on Twitter today. He says he feels okay. He will be back in 14 days as he quarantines. And Kingston was slotted into the main event of tonight's show to challenge John Moxley for the AEW Championship. I love how they made sense of that because, Jesse, as you guys know, in the chat as well, you too, man, uh, Kingston was not eliminated from the Battle Royal. So they slotted him right into that spot and made sense of that situation probably a little too early than they had anticipated, but it makes sense nonetheless. We had Miro making his in-ring debut tonight against... Uh, Janella and Sonny Kiss as he teamed with Kip Sabian. The less I say about that match, the better. And then we had Akaro Shida and Thunder Rosa teaming up against Ivelisse and Diamante. I think you told me via text, Jesse, that a lot of eyes were going to be on that match because of the of the uh, attitude of Ivelisse last week, which I, I didn't really notice what she had done last week until maybe three or four days after we recorded the show, and then all of a sudden I start hearing about Eva Lise and the problems that she has backstage and how stiff she was against Thunder Rosa, which we knew. But I think everybody's seen it if they were on social media. The snap neckmare spot that she completely no sold from Thunder Rosa, and we'll go over that a little bit later when we talk about that match. And then Jericho and Matt Hardy, it seems to be that AEW is maybe going to feud Matt Hardy. And Chris Jericho again. And then we had the return of Sammy Guevara. What did you think of the overall show tonight? I thought it flowed very well. And Tony Khan is doing an excellent job. Yeah. I mean, as a whole, you know, all in all, I, I love the show. It gave, you, it gave you plenty to talk about and think about and plenty to uh, like and not like without calling any of it stupid. You know, if that makes any sense. You're not going to sit and watch a, any kind of wrestling show where you like and agree with everything you see. It's just not going to happen. I didn't like Diamante getting pinned tonight, to be honest. I didn't. I think I think all four women in that ring should have been highly protected. I don't think any of them should have been taking a pin. But, again, it's not about liking everything about it. That's kind of one of the things you can kind of, like, you know, uh, you can kind of critique and get into without calling the show stupid or dumb. You know, I mean, it's not dumb that she got pinned. I just didn't agree with it. So along the lines, things like that, all in all, I, I thought it was a real good show. Yeah, I thought it, I thought it really uh, came across very well on TV. And AEW just has this, it, it, it has this, this vibe down packed. I love the way that they do live shows. And I love the fact that, they take what happens in previous weeks so seriously. Like, they never leave, rarely. I'm not saying that they're perfect. They never leave any stone unturned. Everything that happened a couple weeks ago, two, three, four weeks ago, somehow rears its ugly head again in the current week. Or if you, you know, seen something happen a couple weeks ago, it's always brought to attention on the future shows. I, I love the fact that they just have this sense of continuity and this sense of consistency. And that, I don't want to make this a WWE thing, but that's why NXT has fallen in the last several months because of, of that. There's no consistency. There's no continuity. It's just rush, you know, just making maneuvers for the sake of making maneuvers to combat AEW. Meanwhile, AEW is in this bubble where they're not really bothered by anything else. They're going to do what they got to do, and they're going to, do to, they're going to do what they have to do to put on a good show. Everything is done for a reason yeah. in AEW. Everything is that if you see it, they put it there for a reason to tell the to tell the overall story. So I like this. Rarely do you see a mistake. That's why I mean I, I think you thought that the Kingston spot was a mistake that they're just gonna just just correct on the fly. I thought it was I thought it was intentional. I thought it was intentional to get Archer to Moxley, and then they can quickly put Kingston to Moxley. Without having to explain too much. He was never eliminated. Simple. Yeah. You know, I, I'm surprised people haven't asked that question to uh, to anybody in AEW. Was that planned or was it, a, was it a, a genuine mistake on his behalf or someone in the Battle Royals' behalf? I'm surprised that hasn't really been brought up in the news lately. Maybe it, maybe it was planned. Yeah. Who the fuck knows? I think it was a happy mistake, man. Because 
getting getting Kingston into a title match with Moxley um, in in a regular progressive state would would take years. Yeah, it would take a take a good year, you know. But he just got here. I mean, uh, Kingston, and they found a way to put him in a match with Moxley. It, it, the match was great, and now they can revisit that in a year or two for another championship match, and they can refer back to this match. Yeah. So. Uh, I thought he did very well tonight, and we're going to go over uh, all of that, plus so much more here on the podcast. But thank you guys so very much for joining me here this evening. Hoot Media, you know my question. Are we number one in the IWC for AEW? My analyst, Hoot Media, in the chat does a fantastic job. So let me know. And thank you guys so very much for joining me here on the podcast with Jesse. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. That is on Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for all notifications. Guys, we are dangerously close to 119,000 subscribers for the channel. So thank you very much for all of the support. If you missed anything that I've uploaded during the week, which consisted of that horrific Monday Night Raw review. My God, man. Jesus Christ. Who Media says we're number one. Get those likes up, though. Yeah, get those likes up. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But, man, oh, man. Jesse, quick thoughts on, on Retribution, bro. <laughs> Holy shit, man. One of the, one of, me, personally, one of the best rants that I think I've done all year was the first 30 minutes of that show on Monday. What do you think of Retribution, man? T-Bar and Mace and my good old buddy Slapjack over there. What do you think? Honestly, you know what? You want to know what I think? How this this shit just got out of control and ridiculous? I think somebody came up with the idea of retribution. I think somebody came up with the core idea of it, ran it by Vince, and I think maybe he liked it. And then I think he kind of took over and ran with it in his direction, and it just went fucking haywire from there. I honestly believe that's that, that's what it was. And when, when once Vince took full reins of someone else's retribution idea, then the character started changing. That's why we saw the people changing from the firebomb incident, and they started adding more people, and then they started adding in storylines from you know five years ago, from ten years ago, and from twenty. It's all stuff that Vince has written back in his career. I, I think he took it ran took it ran with it. And now it's just a lame duck. It's, it's just a running meme at this point. Yeah, it's terrible. I, I genuinely feel bad for everybody involved in that storyline. And uh, all of the men that had their name changed. And I'm sure you guys are going to get a, a, a crack at the news coming up this weekend when I report it on Off the Script, man. So much retribution news. It's so terrible. I got my own conspiracy theories. I honestly think it's something to do with uh, somebody on the main roster genuinely doing it on purpose. There's no, there's no fucking way anybody thought that those names and that presentation were going to get over the way that they did. Uh, I, I don't want to believe, I don't want to sit here and believe and think somebody thought that was going to be successful. I honestly think that they've set these people up for failure and they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. The thing, the thing that makes no sense about it, it's the most important thing on the show. So you took something that that you're trying to run with to 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 get over over somebody or to make someone look bad or dumb or stupid, but it's the biggest overall story arc on the show. So that is a lot of effort just to try to get one over on somebody. It's not like it's a side deal. It's it's the biggest story on Monday Night Raw. Yeah, and it uh, accumulated the second lowest third hour rating in the history of the show. So there you go. There you go. There you go. So if you guys missed that epic rant, go and check it out. Uh, link is down below in the description along with the off-the-script extra that I uploaded yesterday talking about how there was backstage news of retrib being, Retribution being laughed out of the building as reported by WrestleVote. So go and check all of that out. I got a nice little rant on Molina as well, blasting the dirt sheets, blasting Meltzer when it had nothing to do with Meltzer. It was Mike Johnson backed up by source after source after source after source about her coming back. So go and check out those rants on Monday and Tuesday. Links will be down below in the description. If you guys want to support the podcast, you can certainly do that in a variety of ways. Number one, Patreon. 
Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Go get your off-the-script masks. Mouthmasker.com slash OTS. If you guys want to go and get yourself a t-shirt, the official off-the-script shop is ex- exclusively on Bonfire.com. Go and check those shirts out. Still available for sale. So make sure you guys go and do that. Links are down below for all of that as well. And today's podcast is brought to you by Harry's. Harry's.com slash script. Your value trial set is waiting for you. As soon as you use our sign-up link, you guys are going to be on your way to the best shave of your life. We'll talk about Harry's a little bit later, but harrys.com slash script. If you guys want to support Harry's and you need some good, and I mean good, shaving equipment for yourself, man. Let's get into the news, guys. Uh, I got a lot of AEW news that I kind of want to run over because the show is the show, and you guys know that we'll run through that, but I got some news here. Shauna, speaking of the women's division, we got a nice little nucleus of women on AEW right now, Thunder Rosa, who knows how long she's going to be there. We got Hikaru Shida, we got Ivelisse, we got Diamante, we got Anna Jay, who seems to be coming into her own. Uh, We got uh, Shauna making her return, hopefully, and that is what's in the news. Next month, Shauna will be back on AEW TV. She has not appeared on AEW TV, TV since February 26th of Dynamite this year. She's been stuck in Europe since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, and AEW has not been able to use her because of travel restrictions. The same thing is happening with PAC. Same thing is happening in WWE with everybody in the UK that was on North American soil like Pete Dunne and Jordan Devlin. They will not be... Uh, available until the restrictions are lifted. But Shauna posted this on social media. It was a lot of fun to do with my coworkers and meet new people and have fun. I'm leaving next week to spend 14 days in a neutral, non-banned country by Mr. Trump's proclamation. After 14 days, I can enter the United States. So let's hope for no roadblocks. End quote. Uh, I know you've been keeping a very close eye on the women's division, Jesse. How do you think it's going to be amped up with Shauna making her return? I thought she looked great in the time that we had her on AEW television back in February. I hope she isn't too rusty, but I would love for her to get back into the swing of things because I do think she has a ton to offer this women's division. She was, I think she was a, um, a bright star before we got the likes of the, uh, the, the new AEW four horse women, you know, sort of say, you know, um, is she up to these four as caliber? I don't know. And where's Riho? Uh, that I don't know. Quite honestly, I don't care. Uh, I was never a big fan of Riho. But, uh, Me either, but they, they tagged her as being the, the best in the company, and then she disappeared. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I haven't heard anything about Riho or where she has been. Um, I'm assuming she's back in Japan. But as far as Shauna goes, she'll be back. And another piece of information as far as the women's division AEW go there, they're they're seemingly bolstering that division and all of our words, all of our cries for for months have finally been heard. So not only Shauna, but Serena Deeb has signed with AEW and you guys know she had that great match with Thunder Rosa and she'll be working, uh, I, I think she worked Tuesday's episode of Dark, if I'm not mistaken, Jesse, right? She went against, uh, Kylan King in a singles match, if I'm not mistaken. Before signing with AEW, Deeb was working with WWE. Uh, she joined the company in 2017 to become a coach at the Performance Center in Orlando. She also also worked that year's May Young Classic, which was a comeback story of sorts for her. She departed WWE earlier this year when the company decided to let a bunch of wrestlers, staff, and employees go due to budget cuts related to COVID-19. AEW made the official signing of Serena Deeb on Monday with a post on Twitter. So... We got a nice little nucleus, like I said, Jesse. We got some women right now that's that's right now a staple on AEW television. We got two more joining the ranks. And remember, I know you're not high on her, but Britt Baker's going to be there. We got Big Swole there. I'm not really too high on Big Swole. She needs to get a lot better. And a lot of people are forgetting that AEW has Chris Statlander on the DL till early next year. So... When, a- when, when AEW is at full strength with their women's division, if we see what we see now on television with these names added and then Statlander coming back, maybe, I'm not throwing it out there that's going to happen, maybe they're interested in Tessa Blanchard. They bring in Tessa. Uh, we're looking at a vastly different 
AEW women's division if all of the stars will align for, for that division. I don't want to get into the Britt Baker thing because I don't feel like dealing with all the memes, but she doesn't fit in what they're trying to build right now, period. And if, and if Big Swole needs work, what the hell is the Britt Baker? Okay, never mind. Well, look, <laughs> no, Big Swole does need, you know, some work, but you know, she's better than pretty much everybody else under, which is, includes Britt Baker. So I don't think she's a factor anymore, man. They've kind of went away from trying to make her the top of the division to more on the comedy side of the main. Her, all of her feuds and matches are focused around comedy, which where they should be because she can't wrestle, man. She she can't. I don't, so I don't think I, I don't think she's gonna be as important if they get full time deals for a Thunder Rosa, Diamante Evilise, you know. And I mean, I don't. I just don't think it's gonna happen. They don't care about her that much anymore. Yeah, and this is exactly what we talked about uh, leading into the pay per view with uh, Sheeta and Rosa. Uh, Rosa has pretty much single handedly given this entire division a standard in which they cannot go backwards on, and uh, they have to continue to push forward here because. I don't think the fans are gonna. I don't think the fans are gonna want anything else. They're gonna expect a certain level of performance by the women. And Thunder Rosa single handedly has come in here and given us all of that. So AEW yeah. needs to be careful. Yes, it is not gonna. It's not gonna. Not to say Sheeta was bad. Not to yeah. say Sheeta was bad. Yeah, but but Rosa is, you know, five six years that she's been doing this. You know, she looks like she's been doing this forever. She's so good in the ring. She may be yeah. looked at as one of the best female performers in the world. And yeah. like I said, that standard, AEW needs to keep a close eye on because if there's one, one or two steps back, people will now notice. There is. I mean, essentially, people like Britt Baker is going to be the, the, the head of the Divas division on AEW. I mean, which is going to be just a lot of comedy and a lot of just story because she can't go with the best female wrestlers in the company. No, I don't think so. All joking aside, I don't think so either. So the women's division is coming along quite nicely. Serena Deeb, I'm very excited to see what she does and what type of knowledge and veteran presence she gives that division. So we all ask for them to fix it. They're fixing it. Now we got to see it put into motion. AEW is planning a special themed episode of Dynamite against the presidential debate coming up soon. Uh, AEW is always planning and maneuvering themselves around upcoming TV events. And there's some big competition coming up in October. They will have something planned, as always. The next AEW World Title match for John Moxley will take place on October 14th with him and, and Lance Archer for the AEW Championship. Um, that will take place on what they're calling their one-year anniversary show. And it was noted in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter that AEW has some big competition on the October 7th episode of Dynamite. That's their actual anniversary show and uh, actually as close to the actual anniversary show as they can get because it happened on October 2nd last year yeah. so clearly yeah. that can't happen so uh, the reason why they are maneuvering these shows around as far as the anniversary shows is because they didn't want to run the world title match on the 7th because they already have something special planned for uh, the vice presidential debate that's going to be happening between the Trump and Biden campaigns um, the one-year anniversary TNT show uh, on 1014 will be headlined by Moxley and Archer. Not the 107 show that was originally planned. They moved it to the 14th, and that's happening then. So you guys can look forward to that. AEW realizes that a vice presidential debate can, can and will certainly take away viewers from their show. So we'll have to see what happens when AEW goes live against the presidential debate, the, the vice presidential debate, and what they have planned for that. So. Um, be wary of that in the schedule. I will definitely update you guys as soon as we get closer to that date. Uh, will Hobbs, he was supposed to be on the show tonight. In fact, he was, but not in a wrestling capacity. AEW is set to give Will Hobbs a major push in AEW. And this was on Wrestling Observer Live. Dave Meltzer said this, and I quote, Man, my old friend Dave Corner, who died a few years ago, would have freaked out because him and Will Hobbs were real close friends and he was always trying to push something for Will Hobbs. Will oh, was always physically impressive. He just never really got looks or anything like that. He went to AEW to do jobs, and Tony Khan liked him. And they did that big battle royal spot to get him over it all out. And now he's going to be a guy that they are pushing. He's in there with good people right now, end quote. Um, the one thing that I was 
very disappointed in before we got to Dynamite tonight was the fact that with Lance Archer coming down with COVID and everything changing in that six-man tag, I wanted to see what Will Hobbs could do on the big stage and what he can do in there against a guy like an Archer and against a guy like a Brian Cage. Um, what do you think of Will Hobbs, Jesse? You, you have seen Will Hobbs more than I have because you've been watching Dark on a weekly basis. I know he's physically impressive. I know what he can do as far as a big guy. But when I look at him, I look at somebody that could be... I don't want to use Bobby Lashley as as a comparison because I, I think Bobby Lashley is just so much more of a physical presence than, uh, than a Will Hobbs, but... He can be that big man, that big athletic guy that does freakish shit when you don't know or don't expect him to do so. And all I want to see from him is some sort of charisma. I want to hear him speak. I want to hear what his background is, why I should care about him. Maybe some sort of character thrown in there. Maybe AEW comes up with something for him. But what do you think of Will Hobbs as a whole so far and them pushing him on AEW television? Stand off on me, though. I mean, yeah, he... He looks impressive. He looks like he has it all, but we don't know anything about him. We don't. We haven't heard anything from him, really. Why is he here? Why is he, you know, siding with Moxley? We just know nothing. Yeah. You know, he he's he he's literally like a a white meat Rocky Maivia with the puffy, you know, hairdo and the blue, you know, straps and tangles on. I mean, it's just it's boring. All right, I understand they want to push him, and he maybe he is the guy to push. But as far as we're all concerned right now, is why and who is this guy? You know, you just can't be strong and come out and say yes, we love you. But we we need a reason to like you. We have no reason to. You know who re- you know who he reminds me of. Are you familiar with Willie Mack on Impact Wrestling? Yeah, yeah he reminds yeah. me. Obviously, Willie Mack is fucking phenomenal at what he does. Yeah. And uh, I, w- you know, when he's a free agent, I hope I would hope AEW takes a look at him too. But um, he reminds me of a of a young Willie Mack, not as athletic. I don't know if he can do the things Willie Mack does, but he reminds me of that presence, mm-hmm. like of a Willie Mack presence. Yeah, and and we've seen enough of Willie Mack to 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 care about him. Yeah, you know, I mean, and we and we know his level of charisma and everything. I mean, that, that, that's just the thing. We just need to see more of um of Will, why he's here, and what's going on with him. Because he was just literally put here. I was, seeing, I was watching him on Dark, and they were talking good things about him and things like that. But I think this is one of those, one of those instances where this guy could have benefited for some, um, from some promo packages before he just put on, on Dynamite. Yeah, I agree. I, I absolutely 100% agree. Someone in the chat said Will Hobbs has a backstory from his older brother saving him from getting shot. And his older brother took the bullet for him, which gave him the motivation to become a wrestler. Well, I need that. Whatever that, if that is true, I need I need to see that and hear that on TV. That's not a backstory. That's his life story. I know, but still, that's going to give him <laughs> some sympathy as far as the baby face goes. You yeah, know? I mean, what happens when he turns heel? He's supposed to forget about that shit? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> well, it, well, it happened to Cedric Alexander. Well, look at the story he had going into the Cruiserweight Classic. They dropped that like a fucking ton of bricks. Yeah, look, I mean, it's good to have that kind of an interesting backstory, but that can't be your 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 gimmick. I mean, what I mean. Come oh, on, Rich Swan right. happened to Rich Swan. Never mind, not Cedric Alexander. Rich Swan. Cedric Alexander oh. had his own story. Cedric Cedric's story in the in the Cruiserweight Classic was that he was overweight and he made the weight limit. It was a struggle for him to make the weight limit. Rich Swan yeah. had his parents uh, pass away, I believe. Oh God, yeah. yeah. See, that's it. we need something more than that. Mm-hmm. In the, either that. I mean, or or they can they can just completely eliminate all of that stuff by just having them come out white meat, white meat, white meat, and just have them turn on Moxley. All right, and and the end of it, turn on Moxley, go full heel, give an explanation as to why you did it, and then you don't need as much charisma. Now you can just come out and be a quiet asshole. Yeah, you know, and get over like that. Uh, if, if 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 his problem is charisma, if his problem is mic skills, if his problem is connecting with the crowd, just have him turn on the biggest baby face you get and just shut up about it, and that'll do it for him. Seriously. Speaking of assholes, Booker T, always oh, okay. uh, always an asshole. Booker T had some comments about uh, why Miro shouldn't have taken a shot at WWE. Oh my god. Oh. So Miro debuted on Dynamite two weeks ago. His wife is getting buried on Monday Night Raw because of said debut. And if you think otherwise, you're a fucking idiot. 
Just want to let you guys know that right now. Lana is getting, Lana sucked beforehand, but she's getting buried by Nyla, not, not Nyla, Nia, Nia Jax. I'm sorry, Nyla. I don't mean to disrespect you by comparing you to uh, Nia Jax. Nia Jax, she got thrown through, through a table two weeks in a row on Monday Night Raw. And Booker T says Miro shouldn't have taken a shot at WWE on Dynamite. During his Reality of Wrestling podcast, Booker T spoke about Miro's AEW debut. He said that Miro should have waited to take a shot at WWE. He said you only get one good shot, and it was important to make it count. He says this, and I quote, Yeah, man, of course it was a big surprise to everybody. Will he make an impact? Of course, because he was making an impact in WWE as far as Rusev Day goes. Well, maybe we should ask Vince McMahon on that one. Fans were getting behind him at one point. The Bulgarian brute, when he first came up with Lana, he had a lot of momentum going, so definitely I think he can be an asset to the company. And then arriving the way he did during the COVID times, people were not expecting to see big money players get shifted around. And then boom, he shows up, and it's definitely going to be good for him and the company. One thing I think he missed the boat on, and this is just me talking, going to AEW and first night, boom, take a jab at WWE. That's all right, but if you really want to add fuel to the fire and you really want that star to shine bright, you start causing havoc before you leave the company. I always say that if they fire me at work that I'm breaking something on the way out, I'm making noise and somebody's going to want to sign me immediately. Then I come in and then I'm really talking major noise and just going all the way over the top. So, yeah, a moment was missed. For you young guys out there, there's a moment and you only get it once. Then that moment, poof, it's gone forever. It's like a miracle. It just disappears, end quote. I have no fucking clue what he's talking about. This was, this was nothing more than gibberish. I don't know what the fuck he wanted Miro to do, to be quite honest with you. That was a man that was suppressed for far too long. He said what he did. He moved past it, and now he is going to move forward and show everybody in that company exactly why they are making a mistake letting him go. I don't know what the fuck Booker T is talking about, but he said what he said, and that's it. Well, what else did he need to do? What does he mean you only get one shot? Like, well, Brody Lee's been taking shots at WWE every other damn week. <laughs> the whole get, the whole character was Vince McMahon for the first three weeks. Yeah, I mean, yes, whole damn gimmick. I mean, you get plenty of shots. You get Tony Khan, man, have a way. Shoot. AEW takes a shot at WWE every week. Just because they're yeah. of their own fucking stupidity, but they deserve it. Yeah. I don't know, Booker, Booker T's an idiot. I mean, I don't, I don't know who the fuck listens to his podcast, but uh, there's probably somebody out there probably saying to themselves, I don't know who listens to that JD asshole. So, here, it goes a, both here's ways. Thing, here's the thing about WWE getting upset about shots taken from a, from at AEW, you know, at WWE. The thing is, I remember when Vince and a lot of other the um, corporate guys, they used to say this all the time. Is that when you're number one, you don't care about what number two is doing. You don't care. Yeah. So if that's if that's the case, why do they care what AEW is saying? WWE is number one, and nobody's disputing it. Yep. So why do you care what the what number two is doing? You're you're the best. Don't don't worry about it. I don't know. I I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it could be looked at in that uh, AEW way, too. They're number one on Wednesday nights. They're not really looking at what NXT is doing. They don't give a fuck what NXT is doing. Look at NXT uh, run circles around themselves to try and compete with AEW. Number one is worried about number two, right? I mean, what do they do? They do do take their their, their jabs at them when WWE does something just completely publicly dumb. Because we laugh at it as fans, and they know we laugh at it. So why they don't? Why do they have to get on TV and pretend it never happened? It's funny. You take a stab at it. We'll get a chuckle out of it, and we'll move on. Yeah, you know, it's not, not a big deal. What well, was a big deal, man? I know we talked about it last week. That parking lot brawl between the best friends in Santana and Ortiz. Probably one of the best three fights I think we've seen in many, many, many years. I got news on that parking lot brawl between both of those teams. It was the main event on Dynamite last week. Wild match, a variety of weapons, cars being used. Trent took some damage as he was powerbombed on the roof of a car before being tossed onto the windshield, which saw him have glass in his back, caused him to bleed. Uh, Trent's mother, Sue, is probably the most over-talent in the entire fucking company right now. You you told me via text, Jesse, Sue is actually more over than Ricochet on WWE television. 
Facts. Sue, Trent's mother Facts. Sue is more over than Ricochet, Mustafa Ali, and Apollo Crews all rolled into one. Yep. No, I don't I really understand that, but clarify. thanks, Bruce. I want to clarify that. And what I said after that was, if you gave Ricochet to AEW Creative, and they gave Don't Ricochet, worry, it's happening. Huh? It's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you gave, and AEW Creative gave Ricochet one-third of the amount of energy they gave Trent's mom. I mean, they could just sneeze on Ricochet, and he'll be a world champion, the best wrestler on the planet. That's how little effort it takes to get a guy like that over. But right now, as it stands, Sue is more over than he is. It's crazy. Sue was uh, actually... Funny thing is, Sue has a t-shirt on Pro Wrestling Tees, and I think Pro Wrestling Tees Twitter actually tweeted out saying that she has a very good chance of being the number one selling t-shirt on Pro Wrestling Tees. Wouldn't doubt it. Unbelievable. Anyway, the end of that match, all the best friends go over the boys, Santana and Ortiz, formerly of LAX. Uh, Orange Cassidy came in with the interference at the end, and then Trent's mom showed up, flip, uh, flipped off Santana and Ortiz with a middle finger, and she drove away in a brand new minivan. Jim Ross noted on commentary that it was the best parking lot brawl that he's ever seen. That's high praise from Jim Ross. The guy has seen fucking 30 years worth of wrestling. He knows what he's talking about. Probably longer than that, and he knows what he's talking about. Tony Khan mentioned on Twitter that they filmed that match in one shot. One shot, no takes at all, just one take, which was pretty impressive, with the only change to it being that they bleeped out an F-bomb. Dave Meltzer mentioned on The Observer Live last week that AEW filmed this match last Thursday in Jacksonville, and Tony Khan wrote, it was all shot in one take, no edits, other than dropping in the audio on the F-word, one amazing take, end quote. All four of those guys deserve fucking immense pay raises after what they did. And, and when I read that, I'm like, man, oh, man, that's fucking impressive. It really is. Didn't I, I heard that match got five stars. Did it get five stars? Meltzer gave it five stars. I heard it. That's, that's amazing. Five-star brawl. That's that. And that's the news, guys. I appreciate you hanging with me and Jesse as we go through the AEW news. Let's get into the actual show. Super Chats are open. We'll be taking Super Chats at the end of the show. Make sure you guys remember to hit that thumbs up. We are at 370, 389 likes. Get those likes up, man. Let's see 500. Let's get 500 likes before we get into the second hour of the show. We're at 1028 as far as live viewers goes. Thanks for making this the number one show in the IWC tonight for your Wednesday night. Show opened up with Miro and Kip Sabian with Penelope Ford against Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss. Get them the fuck off my TV. Please. Please. Now, I was happy to see Miro. I know how good Kip Sabian can be. A lot of people uttered the same sentiments that I did, you did. A lot of people on my Twitter feed did the same thing. I had a couple of buddies of mine tweeting me. The match was sloppy. The match was sloppy. And then the match actually had an injury scare, which I hope is not an injury scare, and that was just Miro just being a damn good seller. But the match was sloppy, not because of Miro and not because of Kip Sabian. It's because we have indie trash in the ring like Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss. I cannot stand... Listen, Joey Janela is fine by himself. He's, got, he's had great matches with Moxley. He's had great matches with Kenny Omega. But I mean, if you can't have a great match with Kenny Omega, I don't know what the fuck you're doing in the ring. But... I enjoy him more when he's single. This tag team between Joey Janelle and Sonny Kiss is not working for me. I think it's fucking terrible. The entire Sonny... Again, I don't want to come off sounding a certain way, but people are going to make me sound like that anyway. Sonny Kiss is not a professional wrestler. I'm just, sorry. Just, 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 just let me handle the Sonny Kiss thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. When, Sonny Kiss, when Sonny Kiss came in, um, and, and this is documented. You can go back and look at the watch the archives. I mean... I'm all about giving him a shot because I figured that they could take his gimmick, leave his gimmick the way it is in interviews and promos. And then when he got in the ring, I would have him get in the ring and just be a straight up legit, no bullshit wrestler and just have him go do it. Yeah. And I think that would have worked. I mean, no people would not have been a fan of the other side of him, but it would have gave him the opportunity to stick, you know, to, to the culture he wanted to stick to, which I could appreciate. 
Yeah, but the, but. the, the, the thing is, Jesse, yeah, a lot of people are going to blame Miro for this. Oh, he's rusty, blah, blah, blah. They're going to blame Kip Sabian no. for this. Miro is a world-class athlete. When have you ever seen him botch m- much of anything in the ring yeah. with WWE? He's in, the, he's in the ring with two men who are not even on the same planet as him as far as in-ring technique. Yeah. And you're putting Joey Janelle and Sonny Kiss in that ring with Miro. Of course it's going to be bad because they are that bad. Yeah, it's not. Um, Sonny Kiss's style is not meshing with, with, the, with the serious side of wrestling. No. The, the style that he does, it needs to stick to the comedy side. It needs to stay in matches with people like Colt Cabana mm-hmm. and things like that. But when you put him in serious matches and then try to incorporate his comedy spots, it's kind of... It just doesn't mesh well and doesn't look good. All right. Now, again, I was a huge proponent for bringing Sonny Kiss in and completely dropping his flamboyant side while in the ring and then going back to it out of the ring. It, I thought it would make a, like an awesome, you know, two-sided personality and everything else. But that's not what they're doing. And it's not entertaining. And it's bringing down the talent that he gets in the ring with. So... Well, and, and I, I don't know what, why. What it is. I don't know why they just didn't do Joey Janela versus Miro. I thought that would have been a, a better one-on-one match than the tag team match that we got tonight. I don't know why they put these four people in the ring together tonight, but it is what it is. They're doing this best man thing with Kip Sabian and Miro, and yeah, Miro is the best man. Stay, I think Miro's gonna stay in a tag team. Um, through through the Kip Sabian wedding, at the very least, they yeah. kind of just break them into break them into the storylines, you know. Yeah, and, and he's incredibly over. I mean, th- this crowd loved him, and my God, man, I, I my first tweet of the night for Dynamite, he looks fucking unbelievable. He looks to be the best shape that I've ever seen him in tonight. Yeah, yeah. Oh, somebody else just just mentioned I, who was this? Who was this? Uh, Kevin. He said he, he mentioned Velveteen Dream being like Sunny Kiss. I think that's kind of exactly what I was trying to say. Velveteen Dream is very flamboyant and weird and all that stuff in promos, but when you get in the ring with Dream, it ain't no joke. He will kick your ass. Yeah, you but know? yeah, and, but Velveteen Dream's a professional wrestler. Sunny yeah, Kiss, Sunny Kiss that's is not. I mean. Yeah, Sunny Kiss can't go like that, so it's not working, man. Yeah, something yeah. needs to be done. Get, get, put him on dark, keep him on dark. Uh, this match was sloppy. Miro, you know... Always great to see. He came out. He looks physically unbelievable. The body language on Miro, it was something along the lines of he's so happy to be here. He's just free. His his just body language was just screaming, I'm fucking free from Satan over in WWE, yeah. which is great. But they used Miro here pretty well in this match. They didn't really give him a big spotlight. They got him in late in the match for that big tag, and they played mostly to his strengths. So yeah. Janela got, Janela and Kiss actually got some some shine on Sabian early here. Sabian and Miro cut Kiss off and worked him over. Very formulaic tag team match for a little bit, but they were working pretty decently in the beginning stages of this match. Janela got a hot tag. Things got sloppy. Miro and Janela with Sabian brawled to the floor. Miro sold his ankle, and he was limping for a bit. Uh, he did come down hard on it, and then he was jumping around on it as if he kind of maybe twisted his ankle or tweaked his ankle a little bit. And I'm like, holy shit, I hope this is not a legitimate injury in his first match on Dynamite. That would be terrible. Miro then was selling the effects of the ankle. He tried to launch Sabian over the barricade to Janela. Janela was supposed to hit something midair, but the camera crew did a very good job of not steering away from the botch. So they got a good shot of it. And... We seen the botch just happen right then and there. Sabian landed right on his fucking head over the barricade. We didn't see him hit that hit his head on the barricade or or, or over the barricade rather. Uh, but we we seen him just come straight down over the barricade. Janella then tries to fly over the barricade from the crowd, do a springboard on top of the barricade. He slipped off the barricade. Miro tried to catch him and failed in doing so. So Miro then back in the ring used a accolade. I'm not sure if he's calling it the accolade. He didn't really give it a name. The announcers didn't really give it a new name yet, but he used what was formerly the accolade in WWE. He did yeah, he didn't ye- know what to call it. He did yell game over. <laughs> so I'm assuming it could be game over now that he's a big time Twitch guy. So we got the accolade on, and it was that exactly game over for Janela. Uh, uh, on Sunny Kiss, rather. He got the 
accolade on Sonny Kiss for the win. That was it. Um, again, sloppy match. Great to see Miro. Uh, I'm very interested to see what they do with the Sabian wedding with Penelope. Before now that Miro is involved, I was not interested in it at all. Obviously, this is setting up Miro to break away, like you said, Jesse, and turn on Kip Sabian and then maybe have them feud after the wedding is over and then break Miro away on his own because I could definitely see him being a major player in AEW. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it looks like, yeah, they're just going to bring him in, get his feet wet, um, have him interact with a few different, you know, uh, personalities and probably find out where they're going to go from there because everybody just can't get catapulted to the top. Somebody's going to have to work their way through the system, you know, so. And this is the best idea for him. Man, I don't think they know exactly which direction he's going to go as far as full heel, where they're going to go with this best man gimmick after that. But at the same time, it really don't need to right now because Miro is one of those guys where once you put him in front of people, they'll let you know what they want from him. Like this, like his first day out, they started chanting Miro Day and this and that. They're literally making his own damn T-shirts for him. I you was know, literally so. going to say that. Uh, th- like yeah. e- even though I agree with you, I don't, I don't know if AEW has any long-term vision right now. They're just doing this small little thing with Kip Sabian. The fans are yeah. clearly going to guide AEW in the right direction with all of this Miro stuff. No question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he he's that polarizing, and they'll let us know. Yeah. I mean, they'll. I mean, it, it'll be awesome. It, whatever they do with him, I think it's gonna be on the level of like Brody Lee, like some just just someone just so underused in WWE, and over here is so valuable. I don't know where AEW would be with this whole Dark Order shit if it wasn't for Brody. He put this shit way over. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of... We'll talk about Brody Lee in a little bit. I don't want to jump ahead, but, you know, there are people in the community that look at Brody Lee as like, oh, this is a WWE reject. It's the same thing with Miro. You know, there's yeah. nothing special about Brody Lee, but where was the Dark Order before all, all, all of Brody Lee's influence and him leading the Dark Order? They were, they were, they were jobbers. Yeah, they were jobbers. And now look at them. Yep. Retribution. Look at them now, man. Especially on BTE, man. They, they are, they are, they are the, the best, best segment on, B, on, on uh, BTE. Internet, hmm? uh, to me, they're the best segment on BTE. They're, they're, they're the, best, the best thing on BET. Best thing on BET every week. Eddie Kingston walked out. He said to leave the hard cam on him. So he walked out immediately after the match was over. With Miro, Sabian, and Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela. Leave the hard cam on him because he wanted to talk to the people at home. Said he's getting an AEW world title match tonight because he, he was never eliminated from the Casino Battle Royale. Said his 18 years in this business is another reason he's getting a title shot. He said he and Moxley were cut from the same cloth, but then Moxley sold out to the world of sports entertainment. He said he never did. He said he stayed with the fighters and outlaws, and I didn't sell my soul to the devil. He said before he puts Moxley down and becomes the new world champion, he wants to look into the entertainer's eyes. Mox came through the side door and walked down the bleachers with his title. Excalibur said Kingston is a master of pushing people's buttons. They had a brief forehead-to-forehead stare down, and the referees and officials came down to pull them apart. During this segment here, so um, it was nice to have Eddie Kingston on com- on uh, on the microphone. There, he argued why he earned the title shot due to the Casino Battle Royale. They made sense of that. He brought that up, and I love Eddie Kingston's promos. He never overstays his welcome. He's always short to the point. He's very intense. He looks right into the camera. Whoever he's talking to knows that he is talking to them, and. I just like how they've been portraying him on AEW television. So I love the fact, most importantly, that they made sense of the Casino Battle Royale situation. And with the audible called, with Lance Archer and Brian Cage being out, that they had such an easy out here in Eddie Kingston being slotted in there with John Moxley for the AEW title. It might, it, might, it might be a little too soon for them, but at least they had that plan B, and they knew they had that plan B so they could go with it. They had to speed. They had to speed it up a little bit, which is fine. You know, shit happens. Um, you know what I like about what they do with Eddie Kingston? They give him a microphone every week. That's that that goes along with you. You 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 highlight their talents, and you just kind of hide what they don't do as well. 
give Eddie a give 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 Eddie a, a microphone every week and and you're good to go. You know, same way as MJF. They don't even have to wrestle, dude. Just give him a mic for five minutes and the segment was worth it. So Eddie Kingston walked out and they had that pull apart brawl, and that was really good stuff there. Very excited about that match when it was announced on Twitter. And I knew they were going to have a good match just based off the history between both of those guys. Uh, we got Kenny Omega walking out to the stage, and then he sat with the announcers at the commentary table. Excalibur asked him about Paige and the tag team that is no longer. And Kenny Omega said it's time. It's time. He's over that. He's moving on. Paige has to move on. It's about time we get Kenny Omega in one-on-one action. But Adam Page, apparently he's sticking with the long pants, Adam Page. I enjoy the new look. I like the new look for Adam Page. He went one-on-one with Evil Uno. And before anybody starts shitting on the Dark Order, and before anybody starts shitting on me, enjoying Evil Uno, I am here to tell you that Evil Uno is fucking great. I think Stu Grayson and Evil Uno are one of the best tag teams in the world. You are looking at two guys that... Always give you a quality tag team match. Always. And now to see Evil Uno in a one-on-one situation against somebody as good as Adam Hangman Page is going to be very interesting to see what he could do all by himself without Stu Grayson. But man, oh man, he looked fucking great tonight. 13 minutes in there with Page, two minutes away from the time limit draw. And this was a great match, man. What do you think of Evil Uno as a singles tonight against Adam Page? I mean, and again, it goes back to... The Dark Order can pretty much be on every segment of the show. And it wouldn't necessarily be overbearing because they come in different levels. You get, you get Stu who loses to Hangman. You know, and then you get Brody who whips ass. And you get these guys who beat these guys. And these guys who are comedy segments. They have their serious uh, division. They have, they have their tag division. They have their, they're all over the place. And they, and so far, I'm not saying it never gets old. So far, it's not getting old. So far, I'm enjoying every segment the Dark Order is in. Omega said he was offered this as a tag match, and he turns it down because it wouldn't help his singles rankings. So he said AEW is the deepest tag team roster in all of pro wrestling. They were champs. He said that they wanted to defeat every tag team, and almost did, but right now, he wants to be a singles. It's nothing to be ashamed of that they did not. So we got five members of the Dark Order on stage, and it made for a very formulaic backdrop to see all of them standing out there with Colt Cabana and Anna Jay up there. According to Jesse, Anna Jay could stand wherever she wants. Uh, Uno was in control. Dark Order approached Paige on the ramp after a commercial break. Uno asked them, you know what? I got this. I want to take Adam Page on all by myself. I don't need anybody's help. So he actually sent the Dark Order to the back. Omega says he wants to win it the right way as it pertains to Paige and Evil Uno. One-on-one, it needs to be done the right way. Colt had some words for Uno and then went to the back with the rest of them. Meanwhile, Paige recovered after Evil Uno was in control, slammed Uno onto the ring apron. He landed a fallaway slam mid-ring and then a shooting star press for a near fall, which is always impressive to see Adam Page do. Uno caught Paige with a pump kick and then a top rope sent on for a near fall. Paige came back with a lariat. He then landed a power bomb into a roll-up for a near fall. He then landed the buckshot lariat soon after for a three count. Very predictable match here with the outcome, but man, oh man, like I said, does it give Evil Uno some, some stock as far as what people think about him? Even though he lost, he, to me, I think he looked even better than Paige did tonight. He looked good. He looked good. I mean, Paige is, Paige is awesome in the ring, and... If you if you don't keep up with him, it'll show you know that you shouldn't that you shouldn't be in that ring with him. But you Uno know, looked awesome. He made Paige look good. Paige made him look good. It was a nice match. Where are where where where, where are they going with Paige? What, what do you see Paige doing? Like how, how long how long are they going to continue this Omega Paige? Oh my God, you know Paige is all all sullen and downtrodden about Omega, and Omega is just kind of. Sticking to his, to his guns here about being a single. How long do you, do you think they play this out with Paige kind of still looking for Omega, but Omega's not there? Well, um, obviously the end of that road is Paige and Omega. Yeah. So, and that's what they're gonna build. That's what they're gonna build up to. 
Um, it probably won't be for any title because it doesn't need to be. And um, where do they go from there? I don't know, because we also got to find out where the Bucks are going to go as well. This kinda, that kind of plays into this too. But the end of this story is going to be Kenny versus Hangman, and it can it can main event a pay-per-view with no title on the line as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, I feel that same way too. Speaking of the Bucks, Shivani, Tony Shivani stood outside the Young Bucks locker room. He said the Bucks wanted to talk to him, so here we are with him. Knocking on their locker room door, Matt came out of the locker room and asked Shivani if he flinched because he opened the door quite wildly. He said, people are noticing the Bucks are acting out of character lately. He admitted that they never should put their hands on Alex Marvez and the referee last week. He unconvincingly said that they are sorry. Tony Shivani was just standing there. He said that they've gone through a lot and lost a lot of friendships a lot of title opportunities, we will do better. So Shivani then said, FTR is the reason for all of this. Matt asked for the next question as he didn't want to talk about FTR. He said, try harder. Shivani asked about FTR winning the AW Tag Team titles. Jackson then asked if they put him up to bringing that up. So he asked if Matt Jackson asked Tony Shivani if he had his phone. So Shivani reaches into his jacket and he grabs his phone Jackson grabbed the phone and broke the screen on Tony Schiavone's phone. Tony Schiavone stood there, and he didn't give a shit about his phone being broken. I know if that was my iPhone 11 Pro Max, I would be crying on the floor if Matt Jackson took my phone and smashed it against the wall, and the entire screen was fucking busted open. Schiavone stood there as if he didn't fucking care. Maybe he knew Matt Jackson was going to pay for the phone. I don't know, but Matt Jackson told him to go get an upgrade, took some cash out, he wanted to put it in Tony Schiavone's pocket, but he realized that the pockets on the AEW Blazers are not real pockets. So he ended up throwing cash in the air, and Shivani said that should be a new chapter in their book. I don't know what's happening with the Bucks here, man, but you, you think that they came off very heelish here with the way that they threw the money at Tony Schiavone. No, I said I don't. Oh, you don't? They didn't come off very heelish. Yeah, I'm, 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 here's my thing. They're supposed to be, I guess, trying to be heel here. Uh, I'm trying to find, like, the most heelish thing that they've done. They broke somebody's phone, and they super kicked somebody, and they threw money at Tony Khan. That's the best you get. They're not heels, man. I don't know what that's what, I don't know what they're doing right now. I don't know what they're doing either, you know. Uh, you watch BTE more than, more than I do. Or is, there any, is there anything that is happening on there? Are they playing up this attitude on BTE? Uh, like they're doing on Dynamite, or are we seeing this same type of Young Bucks on, on that show? No, it's the same. It, it, it's just the same on BTE. They, I'm sorry, it's the same on BET. You know, yeah, B, they, BET, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, they just kind of quiet about it. They just kind of just, just ignore Cutler and don't want to talk much and it's all emo. But no, they're not doing anything more heel-ish on BTE either. So it's the same. Well, whatever the case may be, we mentioned this last week, it's going to be a situation where we all know that the match is going to happen between FTR and the Bucks. They're prolonging it. We need, uh, we need something to, you know, guess, I would say marinate, right? We need, we need this to, to marinate before we get to full gear. I'm assuming that's going to be the match. We got all these weeks still full gear, and that's yeah. what we're going to get. So whatever they're doing, it's A, creating interest, we don't know what the Bucks are doing or how they're acting or why they're acting the way that they are. But again, with the tag team championships in AEW, it's probably the most intriguing storyline on television right now. And I'm not, I don't have any problems with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah it's the whole thing like Kenny, Hangman, the Bucks, I mean, uh, all of the elite right now, they just all seem like they're all in limbo, they're all in this little tweener phase. It's like they're trying to figure out which way they're going to... Te- they're not going to stay this way, but it's almost like everything is in the transition phase. They're waiting for certain... Maybe they're waiting for certain feuds or matches to wrap up before they turn the corner on this story arc, before they do a Kenny turn or a Hangman turn or a Bucks turn. Or they're trying to figure it out before they go, but I even like this transition to era, uh, area, to be honest, because they're not just off TV, they're here. But you can tell they just, not, they're not sure. They're undecided. They're trying to figure this shit out themselves. They don't know. We don't know if they don't know if they like Hangman or Kenny or what. They don't know if they want to be heels or faces. They're trying to figure it out. So 
Nothing wrong with that. It, it can't go on forever, and it hasn't been going on forever, so there's nothing wrong with that as they figure out a transition in storyline. You gotta remember, wrestling is an all-year-long project. TV shows get weeks and weeks and weeks off of a hiatus. So I consider this a little hiatus as they transition between storylines. Yeah, mm-hmm. I absolutely agree. And, and I'm thinking here while you're talking, this is four guys in FTR and the Bucks who probably have majority creative control of what we're seeing on TV right now leading to their match. And I'm thinking how this would play out. I, I think I read something along the lines of if the Bucks signed with WWE, how their careers would have been ruined. Something was in the news this week. Uh, they were making fun of it. And it, it goes to show you that if they did sign, their careers would probably be as bad as, uh, as anything on WWE TV right now. And with four guys like this, with creative control over this storyline, it, it's amazing to see how much fun is being had here. And it's also very intriguing to see what they come up with. I always love to see what comes out of and what is produced in a storyline when the actual talent is behind it. And it's not being written by a fucking geek in a boardroom or it's being written by some fucking 70-year-old fucking old has-been that doesn't know what he's doing, that doesn't know what talent is nowadays and produced by some fucking old-timer who's way past his prime, that is just appeasing an old man. I, I, I love the fact that we're seeing four young men here go into this, having their ideas materialize on TV. I love it. Wait, I mean, it, it gets to the point, they were scared to pitch them to their boss, yeah. you know, before. So it, it, must be, it must be very, very gratifying to see your ideas come out and play out on TV like that. I yeah. agree. Brody Lee, another one who came from that... Stanford, Connecticut hellhole. Brody Lee, Orange Cassidy, AEW TNT championship match. Orange Cassidy's been one of the hottest performers on AEW television. Brody Lee has been absolutely fantastic in this in this role as TNT champion. He's got a new lease on life. I've always been a fan of Luke Harper. I hated the way he was used. I hated the fact that people threw him to the side as if he was nothing. And now we got Brody Lee in AEW, and he's just one of the best things on television right now, in my honest opinion. This was a very good match. I get the fact that the Dark Order needs to have a presence at ringside because their leader is in the ring defending their most prized possession. But man, oh man, when I see situations happen like i seen tonight with the Dark Order outside and there's five people out there, four guys and Anna J, and it's just a lot of chaos at ringside. It really does make the referees look like blithering idiots out there. Like, I mean, having that many people out there trying to interfere and get a cheap shot in on Orange Cassidy when the referee's back is turned and he's just turning around and he obviously sees this some nefarious bullshit happening outside. Yeah, he lets it continue anyway. He lets the match continue. It's it's stupid. It's stupid. I I I don't like it. I think it's overplayed. I think it's overdone. I think things need to be done differently. If Brody Lee is so good at what he does, he doesn't need his fucking minions out there. Look at what he does on on being the elite. Like, he beats the shit out of them. Send them to the fucking back. You don't need them out there to beat Orange Cassidy. Am I wrong or am I wrong? You're not wrong. Um, Because I get it. But at the same time, I like the... I, I like the camaraderie. I like the... I like the, I like the sense of consistency from every match, whether it, whether it's a match on dark or a match at a pay per view, the dark order is standing out there at the top of the ramp. I mean, and it's, and, and always, they can have they can have someone like Brody Lee come out and say, "Hey, go to the back, I got this one," or the referee can kick him out here and there. But just like Lance Ar- Lance Archer coming out and murdering someone before every match. The Dark Order is going to come out and be the top of the ramp. You can always get rid of them, you know, through whatever different reasons, you know, but the fact that they come out and they support, no matter what it is, a a pre-show, main event, or whatever, someone from the Dark Order is standing up there representing unless they're told to go to the back. I don't not like that, to be honest. I could do without all of the interfering every match. I get that part. If they just came out, stood, and never did a thing and left, it would serve the same purpose as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, overproduced was the word I was looking for. I thought, yeah. I thought it was a little overproduced. 
Yeah, I don't. Yeah, they don't have to come out and interfere in every match. I mean, I would, uh, I would do the reverse. I do the opposite. If they come out and stand at the top of the ramp, no interference ever. But when they're told to go to the back, those few rare times they're made to stay in the back, I have somebody come out and interfere. I, I will give them. I will give them. I will give them some credit. You know, uh, someone like John Silver and Alex Reynolds and uh, the, those those two other schmucks that were out there with Anna J. You know, I get that Brody Lee is you know, a very dominant figure, and he, he beats the shit out of them, and he beats them up on on uh, being the elite. Maybe maybe it's a situation where they, you know, want to be out there to try and prove their worth to him because you've seen John Silver acting like a crazed maniac. He took Orange Cassidy's jacket. He started fucking doing the Ric Flair stomp on it. He started beating the shit out of the jacket yeah. on, 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 the, on the floor. <laughs> then Orange Cassidy threw his white T-shirt on John Silver. He started beating the shit out of the T-shirt. You know, he was running around with the TNT championship. They were holding that championship like like they were the fucking TNT champion. Maybe it's a situation where, you know, yeah, it's overproduced, but they're also at the same time trying to prove their worth to him so that he doesn't go and beat them up on next week's being the elite. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It is overproduced, but I get why they're there. I just wish that they would kind of tone it back a little bit. Yeah, Silver's hilarious, dude. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it. Nobody wants to see, you know, the, the run-in on every match, but... Um, it makes sense because then you'd be asking, well, why do they only come out for this guy's matches? How come they didn't come out for that guy's matches? Yeah. You know, I thought they were supposed to, they come out for everyone's matches unless the ref kicks them out or is it, I, I like it. I mean, it, it, it makes sense. And that's how they do it. And remember, they're still recruiting. That's how they did a lot of the recruiting when they recruited, um, Colt. When they recruited Cabana, they said, hey, look at us. You know, we stick together. We come out and support each other. And that's how they get, how they recruit people. You know, it's, it's. It's a part of the storyline which I like, but I I'm with you in the part where I don't like that every time they come out they gotta interfere and the ref is trying to chase eight people. I'm the ref. I would kick him out every time right away. Oh yeah, me too. What, what right about what? Away. What about this? Were you thinking this, or was I the only one thinking this? Brody Lee had all of the Dark Order at ringside, and Evil Uno sent everyone in the Dark Order away. Is it going to be a situation where where Brody Lee maybe thinks that Evil Uno is trying to upstage him in a future well, storyline with this? Is there going to be maybe like a, a power struggle for Evil Uno and and Brody Lee? Where, 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 do you, where do you think that's leading? There, there already there already was a little bit of a a, a, a tiff between Brody and and Evil Uno because he, I mean. Evil Uno is number two guy, you know, and Brody's number one, you know, and F number two, you know, I guess. But yeah, on, on BTE, they kind of touched on that a little bit. Was like, you know, we'll, you know, get Uno out of here. It, w- it was teased. It was here and there, but it's not like anything in a form of, oh, you know, Uno's out of here. Not quite that, because he, he craps on everybody. I mean, I mean what, if, every time he shits on Silver, he's going to leave? No, he does it every week. <laughs> you know, it's it's been a part of it, so... But he made a good point. He sent everybody away, then lost the match. Yeah, is that gonna come, is that gonna come up? I'm pretty sure I'm it will. Pretty sure it will. Yeah, Brody Lee. Uh, I'm sure he yeah. sees everything. Is it gonna be a situation you think that Brody Lee kicks Evil Uno out of the Dark Order, or maybe there is an upstaging and a revolt with the Dark Order, maybe booting Brody Lee out as the Exalted One? Could you see something oh, no. like that play out? Oh no, no, Brody's going nowhere. And anybody who leaves the Dark Order. I don't think they're going to be leaving the Dark Order until the gimmick is ready to go solo. Yeah. You know, it, well, I can't see Evil Uno solo. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah. No, Uno's not going solo. They'll, they'll play it up some more. Maybe they'll get. Maybe they'll garner more sympathy for Uno from Brody, and maybe, that, maybe they'll use that to catapult him out into a babyface run. But he's not ready for it right now, no. Yeah. Well, this match was very good, uh, minus all of the little criticisms that I gave and then Jesse talked about here. Uh, we had Jim Ross on more than one occasion mention Brody Lee as far as a Bruiser Brody comparison. So I found that to be quite interesting. You really, you really kind of uh, added that on tonight. But Brody Lee threw Cassidy in the ring after the Dark Order were beating him down at ringside. And Brody threw Cassidy back in the ring, then overshot a senton. He tossed Cassidy back out of the ring again, where the Dark Order stomped away at him again. Brody threw Cassidy into the ring and whipped him into the ropes. Cassidy countered with a swinging DDT. Brody countered with a big boss man slam. 
for a two count. We went to commercial break. Brody was in control for most of the commercial break. Cassidy couldn't even stand. The referee considered at one point calling the match. Cassidy fell again. Brody wound up for a clothesline. The announcers said that this could just be Orange Cassidy just being Orange Cassidy and that he's not really, you know, suffering from the effects of being beaten down by Brody Lee. Could be a strategy. He then dropped again before Brody could strike him. He then surprised Brody with a roll-up. Excalibur said Cassidy was suckering him in. I guess that was it, but from what the what the match portrayed, it looked like Orange Cassidy was getting his fucking ass kicked, never mind him just being Orange Cassidy. Cassidy landed two flying elbows through the ropes at ringside. He then rolled Brody into the ring. He fought off the Dark Order at ringside. He then returned to the ring. Cassidy countered Brody and gave him a stunner. Quickly climbed to the top rope, gave him a diving DDT. Both guys were down, slow to get up. Cassidy did his kip up with his hands in his pockets, landed the running punt kick. Brody stood and yelled. He fired himself up. Cassidy gave him a tornado DDT and an air raid crash, which looked believable as fuck. Man, holy shit, I thought this was the title. Very believable near fall there for Orange Cassidy. John Silver entered the ring like a dumbass. Cassidy gave him an orange punch. Brody quickly gave Cassidy a power bomb and then a discus lariat for the win. Brody Lee retains the TNT championship in 11 minutes. This was fun. This was very good for for uh, for both guys. This was a very good showing by Orange Cassidy. And I mean, just looking looking at the clash of styles here, you can't get any more different than both of these guys. AEW, you know, had their TNT championship. Really built up with Cody Rhodes. He got jobbed out. I don't want to say jobbed out because Brody, I don't want to say anybody gets jobbed out to Brody Lee. It was just a natural progression of the championship. And I think Brody Lee deserves it. He dominantly defeated Cody Rhodes. One of the things that I was asked tonight, Jesse, is why did Orange Cassidy last 11 minutes and Cody Rhodes was beaten down in like four minutes by, by Brody Lee? This is obviously a testament to what Tony Khan and AEW think about Orange Cassidy. If anything, he lost here, but if you want to compare this match to the Cody match, I honestly think Orange Cassidy is just as much a winner uh, compared to Brody Lee than anything tonight. I mean, I mean, you, get, you look, you guys got to look at it in perspective. Cody took all the time building up that title as high as he did and then get oh, oh, obliterated by Brody. And then Brody goes and faces somebody like Orange, and Orange takes him to the limit, goes over 10 minutes with him. But what does that say about Cody? Well, that that's in a way that's Cody putting over Orange as well. That means if Orange is in that match with Cody, then Orange probably would have came out on top as well. He just wouldn't have beat Brody Lee, which is the result that we got. I mean, that's, that's, that's them putting Orange over it. Trust me, they didn't lose sight that it took them seconds to beat Cody but it takes them all this effort to be orange because orange is that legit. That's what they're trying to say. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is I know and I'm waiting with bated breath to see the community freak out when Cody Rhodes comes back and wins the TNT championship and takes it off of Brody Lee, just like he beat Lance Archer for the TNT title in the inaugural match at Double or Nothing. But this is Cody Rhodes, and this is what he does best. This is classic Cody Rhodes storytelling. His brother got beat. His wife got beat. And now he's back to seek revenge and take back what he lost. And that is the TNT Championship. And it's going to happen. And I don't know if we're going to get those every week TNT title matches with Cody Rhodes again when he wins the championship. I quite like Brody Lee defending it when he wants. I guess it fits into his heel character. He doesn't have to be the babyface that goes out there and defends it every week. But I quite like the fact that the title is not defended every week. I like Brody Lee's stance on, you know, fuck all the indie the indie people that Cody Rhodes wanted to give an opportunity to. This is my title. I'm doing it my way. Fuck the old way. Cody Rhodes is going to take that title back, and I can't wait to see the community cry, even though we all know what's coming. So what are you crying about? The the man's going to let his wife get beaten down by Anna Jay in the Dark Order? He's going to let his brother get beaten down by by Brody Lee in the Dark Order? Come on. This is classic old-school Cody Rhodes storytelling. What do you expect? Wins it back. Say again? I don't think Cody wins that title back. No, why not? Why not? I mean, his I, wife, his wife got beat by Anna Jay. His wife got yeah. choked out by Anna Jay. His brother lost. I don't, I don't care. I think he gets his ass kicked again. As far as I'm concerned, Brandy, he can get her ass kicked by Anna Jay again. 
I think you come back and double down on what you did. You made a star. Why make it 50-50 book it and take it back? Let him let him kick his ass again. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. What does Cody need to shine in that in that title for? Dead serious. Make a bigger star. Let Cody come back, get riled up, make a baby face, you know, run at him, beat him down a few weeks and have the title match and let him lose again. It's not going to hurt Cody, man. Cody will be in a high profile feud with somebody else weeks later. And then you'll still have Brody standing tall as a champ. All right. Well, uh, well, I I think Cody's taking it back. And I I think Cody, for some reason, I think Pac is coming back. And I think Pac is going to slide right into that TNT title picture. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it, he needs to be in the world title picture. But uh, well, pro- he's good enough to probably, be. Yes, they're probably wondering how how you know how reliable he is. Yeah, you know. But yeah, I mean, well, think about it. Cody comes back and beats Brody for that title. Where does Brody Lee go in a dark order? Go from there. He just left that feud as a loser. Listen, wait. I'm telling. I'm going to tell you where it goes right now. Cody Rhodes came back, and he's got black hair, folks. He's got no more blonde hair. He looks like somebody off the set of Star Trek. Jesse's never watched any Star Trek, so uh, he's not going to get the point that I'm trying to make. He looked legitimately no. like he could walk onto the fucking Starship Enterprise. Seriously, I thought I was looking at fucking Commander Data come out on, on AEW Dynamite tonight, and I know Cody is a big sci-fi video game guy. Um, I doubt he's watching, but I thought he looked great. It's going to take a little bit getting used to because I got so used to the blonde hair, but he's back on Dynamite after five weeks. He beat up the Dark Order. Uh, the announcers wondered if he was medically cleared tonight. Uh, they all agreed that he looked great. Brody Lee abandoned all of the Dark Orders. Cody Rhodes cleared the ring of the Dark Order. And Dasha was quickly there to interview Brody Lee. He barged in and was interviewed by Dasha. Said Cody has the audacity to return like that after he's been away for five weeks. He bragged about what he did to Dustin and what Anna Jay did to Brandy. And he said Cody is a coward. He held up the TNT championship, then held up a dog collar and chain, and he vowed to wrap it around his neck and that God-forsaken tattoo. Great promo by Brody Lee. I love the fact that they're teasing another match between these two because that's the natural progression of it. But, Jesse, where does all of this Nightmare Family and Dark Order shit end up? I think AEW is getting ready to deliver blood and guts. I think we're going to see the Nightmare Family and the Dark Order in blood and guts, and that's going to be what replaces the elites and the inner circle and what was supposed to be that match back in February. That's what I think the natural progression is here. Wasn't it, wasn't it Cody's dad that, uh, I don't know if he even invented or made famous a dog collar match. Wasn't it, wasn't it Dustin? Um, I wouldn't be surprised, but I know, I know, I know, uh, I know Cody is going to pay homage to his father by having the first AEW blood and blood and guts match be their war games match. I know that was probably, uh, the first thing on a lot of people's heads, and I'm telling you, that's what I think is going to happen here. Yeah, look, if if I'm an AEW creative, here's this is what I'm saying about the Cody versus um, bro, Brody Lee match. The thing is, if you take the title off of him again, the 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 bigger question is where do we go from here with with um with the Dark Order, and I can't see. I, I can't foresee any outcome of them losing right back to Cody again how, and, and Dark Order coming out looking better on it. Uh, I think Brody Lee needs to beat Cody again. They can easily find another top babyface to come and beat Brody down the line, but it kind of makes no sense to have Cody come back and take that win right away. I mean, if they do it, I mean, fine. It's not the worst thing ever, but what was the point? And and why do you need that title on Cody when he has the mic ability and the and the ability to make any match important? You know, he just don't take on any match. He takes on a match that's important. He'll get like the returning pack or something like that. You know, something where you don't necessarily need a title. If Pack comes back and, and, and battles Cody in a match, does it have to be for the TV title? I don't think it does. It's the, that match alone is big enough, and then you can start working the TV title with Brody and someone else. And then again, you didn't go 50-50 booking on this Brody Lee Cody stuff. I don't. I, I think. I think it's a bad idea, man. Bad idea. It's literally 50-50 booking. I don't think you, you shouldn't lose to Cody right now. It's kind of silly. Well, that's the thing. I I, I I don't know. I don't know what they do as far as the outcome here because he gave Cody one week 
for the yes or no about a dog collar match. If you're giving me a stipulation match there, and I don't know, I don't know what a dog collar match stipulation in, entails, but you know, does Cody win that? And then we get blood and guts, and the Dark Order win blood and guts. That would go right back to the point that you made 50 50 booking. You took the title yeah. off Cody, you put it back on Cody, and then you have the Dark Order win in the blood and guts match. If that is the natural progression of this Nightmare Family Dark Order feud, it's 50 50 booking at the end of the day, no matter how you look at it. So who really is going to be over in this thing? Cody's going to have the championship back, but is the Dark Order going to be better off in the end by beating the Nightmare Family in blood and guts? Which is yeah. more which is more important to the Dark Order, getting the win over the overall Nightmare Family or having the second biggest championship in all of AEW right now? The overall thing right now is, uh, the, thing, the thing about 50-50 booking in WWE, nobody gets over. And that's just the thing. Um, I think... The the number one concern in a in a rematch with Cody and Brody Lee is fifty fifty booking because at that point, who is over in it? But I, listen, Brody the Lee one thing the one thing at the end of the day is, is and this, this this should really be on the mind of Tony Khan or whoever's booking this thing. How are we going to make the Dark Order look better than they do now? That's that should be that's what you need to have in mind, and that's how they have to book uh, or what the mentality is. Going into this, that's how you have to book this entire thing. Like, like I, th I think Cody is winning because I just don't see, you know, his wife and his brother getting beat up for him to just come back and lose. That everybody thought that same thing about Lance Archer and him against Lance Archer, and I, I just that was never going to happen. So that's why I'm saying what I'm saying now. I think Cody's going to win the championship, but I do agree with you. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing, the biggest priority here is how do you get the Dark Order better? Yeah. At the end of all of this, let's let's not let's let's not forget this too. Maybe if Cody does win, maybe he doesn't win clean. Let's not forget yeah. that on the way out, Cody was starting to show heel tendencies. Yeah, and he and he and he also had like a strange stare look on his face here tonight too. So let's not forget that. So maybe there's still a turn somewhere in line for Cody somewhere. And so, and maybe that would explain the win or loss, no matter which one happens when he faces Brody Lee again. So that was in the works. He was he was showed a lot of heel tendencies in his last couple of matches. Then he got cocky and in the ring with Brody Lee and then got his ass kicked and he went away. Yeah. So I don't know, but yeah, I see what you're saying, but I I, I don't want to. I'm thinking they did not book themselves into a corner because, the, like you said, the rematch is the uh, the the inevitable you know direction of events for right now. But it's just a matter of the winner, and they're into building stars. Cody is already a star. He helped lay the foundation for AEW. He does not need to win. He just does not need to win. And Brody Lee does in the vein of creating new stars. Listen, man, I agree with you. We'll see what happens. It's a very interesting situation with him back in the fold now. I think the show is better off with him there. It's nice to see him back after five weeks. There was a noticeable absence with him not there. So we'll see what happens. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting situation to say the least. Uh, yeah. Because I was genuinely shocked at the four or five minutes of the match where he lost the championship. So I'm definitely interested to see what they could do uh, given longer to go in the ring and really give us a real legitimate match. Yeah. Yeah. Private Party and Matt Hardy, they were the next segment on the show. Hardy was limping to sell the attack from last week. Hardy thanked the fans. It was his birthday. So happy birthday to Matt Hardy. Today, uh, Hardy thanked the fans for cheering and said, you just made my birthday. Hardy says he's been replaying the events of last week in his head to try and figure out who would attack him in such a cowardly way. He said he had a heated confrontation with MJF, a discussion with Brody Lee about the TNT Championship, and he already has a long story history with the inner circle. He said whoever did it was wearing a mask or a face covering, and he knows who or he knows he was hit with a pipe or maybe a steel bat. He said moments later... What a coincidence it was that Hager and Jericho strolled into the frame with a baseball bat. Hardy said Jericho is his prime suspect right now. And he said private party tore the house down last week with Hager and Jericho. He said he's very proud of them. And the only reason they didn't win is because Jericho and Hager utilized the bat. So Hardy, Hardy was out there with private party. And he said Jericho has a lot of nicknames, but he'll always be known as an asshole. So Jericho came out and... Jericho just relishes in the fact that he knows the fans are going to sing his theme and he waits intentionally till the fucking chorus of the song hits 
And then he, and then he just smiles about. He loves it. He loves it. Look at these fucking marks singing my theme song. So he's out there with Santa and, uh, Santana and Ortiz and Jake Hager. And he's got his baseball bat. Jericho sarcastically said, happy birthday, Matt. And then he said, who gives a shit about your birthday? He complained about Hardy decimating Sammy. He said, nobody knows when Sammy's coming back. But guess what? I do. I lied. He's back right now. So Sammy comes trotting out to the stage. He's danced out to the stage. And Jericho gave Sammy a hug. Jericho said he's the million viewer man because people tune in to see him. He said if he was going to hit Hardy with a baseball bat, he'd do it right in his face so Hardy could see it and see the joy all over his face as he did it. Jericho says he didn't hit him last week, but he'll do it tonight. Hardy says he's not medically cleared, but he'll fight all of the inner circle. So then Private Party took the microphone away from Matt Hardy. Mark Quinn did anyway. Mark Quinn told him to take time to recover properly. But Quinn said, listen, Matt, you may not be cleared, but I'm cleared, and I can step up. He told Jericho he laid him out last week. Isaiah Cassidy then took the microphone and said, listen, it's not your battle. It's not Matt Hardy's battle. It's my battle. So he said next week he wants to challenge Jericho one-on-one, and he wants to make Jericho the Le Champion bitch. So Jericho was just on stage. He smiled and... That was the end of the segment. Now, Jericho's great at, at everything he does. But I think we all know this. It's common knowledge. It's great to see Matt Hardy as well in good spirits. But man, oh man, Private Party needs some work on their, uh, on their promo ability. Little, uh, little, uh, little light there in the promo department. What do you think of uh, Private Party having their first real promo here on Dynamite? Oh, God, that was so fucking cringe, man. It was so bad. I just wanted them to pass the mic to somebody else. And then when I heard that and somebody else, I wanted to hear the next somebody else. It was, oh, my God, man. Don't give those guys a mic. Just give them a ring to perform in. Yeah. Yeah, they need some work there, uh, definitely. But if that is the match next week with Jericho and Isaiah Cassidy, it should be entertaining. Should be entertaining. So we'll see what happens. Could be a nice little, uh, nice little upset there for a private party. And we'll see what happens next week. I'm looking at the chatter on Twitter, and we get Matt Hardy's attacker definitely down, narrowed down to Sting, Marty Skrull, or Pat. Why would there it be Marty Skrull? I don't, I don't know, because he carries a cane, dude. Why would it be Sting? Because he carries a bat. Why would it be, well, it, it could be, pa- ba- listen, it could be Pac because he's a fucking bastard. He's an well, asshole. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, see what ha- listen, man, uh, if it's Pac, I'm glad it would be Pac. Because he'd be back. We need him back. We need him back. We need Pac back. Anyway. Shivani interviewed yeah. Tully Blanchard and FTR in the ring. Tully said that there are new fans each and every week, and they want to show them how great they can be. Said he wants FTR to defend their tag team titles in 20 minutes. Uh, 20 minute time limit matches to be exact. So we want to get FTR to defend their titles in 20 minute time limit matches. He wanted to pick their opponents and give them a brush with greatness. Their first offer was to SCU. He said if they don't win in 20 minutes, they get a check in the winner's column. Harwood talked about who might be next. He talked about the best friends and Said that they're backyard comedic wrestlers. Trent and Chuck Taylor walked out. Trent said last week wasn't a match, it was a war. He said they're still beat up, but they're ready for a 20-minute match right now. Doc said that's fine with them. Let's get a referee out here and start the match. And then the referee is out there, and Dax is in the ring, and we got Cash in the ring, and then they back out like a bunch of fucking weaselly, slimy heels that they are. And then they make the excuse of, oh, yeah, we're fighting champions, but listen, man, we're we're so gracious in what we do. It looks like you guys aren't at 100%, so we want you to go and heal yourself up, and then we'll revisit this in a couple weeks, and it'll be a fair 100% even playing here. So I laughed at that, at the fact that FTR, you know, I could see them really being that, but I know that they didn't mean that, but... They kind of use the, uh, oh, the uh, best friends are injured. So, you know what? Well, we're not going to do it now. We'll do it when you're ready. I love it. 
So Chuck said, at least Santana and Ortiz didn't run from a fight like a couple of weenies. And then they hugged in the middle of the ring, and Excalibur called it a uh, small consolation because everybody got the hug. They got to hug, but they got no title shot as of yet. Should be a great match, man. I'm uh, Listen, a lot of people aren't really too high up on the best friends. I know a couple people that I know that watch the show aren't high on the best friends. I think they're fucking great. Especially after that, 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 uh, that tag team match last week, man. I think a lot of people are uh, looking a little different at the best friends. Yeah, I, was, I was kind of feeling them when they get their mom involved. I mean, who does that to somebody's mom's mini <laughs> I don't know. That was, that, was, that was brutal, man. Yeah, look, man, I, I think I don't think the best friends are, like, the, the greatest in the ring. And I don't think they're the, the greatest, like, at their promos. But I, I think they're good at both. You know, I think they're okay. They're good at telling the stories. I think they're good in the ring. And I, I, don't, I don't not enjoy their matches. I mean, there's. I'm not sitting there saying, oh, God, another fucking best friends match. I mean, and especially when they get orange with them. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying best friends. Is that my favorite tag team on the company? No. I mean, am I looking forward to their matches? No. But when they come on, I'm not turning it off. You know, you know, what, you know, what, it, you know what it is with them? They settled into this role that they're in. Like, they're great. But I don't think people look at them as legitimate tag team champion caliber, you know, guys. But they've fallen into this and gotten comfortable to be in this spot of, man, they're a great tag team and they're a great tag team to have on the roster because you know you're going to get great matches out of them. But that's all people look at them as. A great tag team match that you could plug in in any situation but not be the bell of the ball, you know? That's the type of tag team I look like. I can could, I could see them win, winning the tag titles. Oh, I mean... Only in the vein of, to the point of there's so many good tag teams around, you can't leave one as champions forever. And if they were to ever get the right push, look, see them being champions as of right now, no. But if I, I could see them getting the right push and getting the right streak and getting the right matches, and yeah, I wouldn't sit there and laugh at them being champions. I take them as a serious tag team. You know, it just... They just need to be built up accordingly. Right now, they're just kind of a mid-card tag. And that's 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 how great the AEW tag division is. It feels like they have like a mid-card tag division and then an upper-card tag division is at the same time. So right now, I see them at the mid-card tag division. They they And they could be boosted up to the level of the tag champions and the elite and, and things like that down the road. Now, is this uh, is this thing with Sue going to be uh, just a one-off with the uh, feud, o- feud over the minivan with Santana Ortiz, or is she going to be in a situation where she joins them again? Because I feel like if Trent has his mother there, and she no. is like emotional support there for the team, I honestly think just by that, it could take them to the next level that I don't think they could be looking at on their own. Maybe Sue helps them get there. But now I'm 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 thinking I'm personally thinking of Sue as a little bit of a one off for this feud. I mean, this is one of those things you don't want to drag it out because yeah, I can see Trent's mom kind of getting in the way of making too much sense here in wrestling. But it came up his they had their mom's van and then they get the van destroyed. So his mom their his mom was interjected into the feud. So they used that she was white hot. They took advantage of it, and I'm kind of thinking that they just let her go to the wayside as his feud goes away. And then, yeah, you can revisit it down the road, but you're not going to keep pumping Trent's mom. And that's going to get old quick. Yeah. Yeah. And if that's the case, you know, I don't even know, I don't even know why I brought that up. If that's the case, mm. she may be the most, she'll be the spotlight of the whole fucking team. It'll be, it'll yeah. be Sue and then, and then Trent and, uh, and uh, Chucky e. T. And yeah, then it's going to yeah, be that's, just counter that's, 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 Yeah. Let's not take it too far. Let, let's, let's hit it while it's hot. Let's have some fun with it. Get Sue some, some royalty money for t shirts. You know, and let's see, let's Sue go back to, you know, doing what she does at home until they want to bring it back for another one off. So, yeah. Uh, Nero in the chat says, why do grown men have their mom in this storyline? Shaking my head because her minivan got fucked up, bro. What do you want her to do? Up her van, dude. Jesus Christ. <laughs> man. If God. somebody fucked your mother's minivan up, you're not going to fight for your mom's fucking honor. Come on, bro. Don't be an asshole. Jesus, do you love your mom? Probably not by the fucking stupid comment in the chat. Moving on. Ivelisse. Let's talk about Ivelisse. Ivelisse was in uh, some hot water with the IWC last week after somebody gift her no-selling a Thunder Rosa snap neckmare. 
And legitimately, I seen it. I didn't even see it live happening because I was probably in my fucking iPad taking notes. I looked up. It fucking happened. I missed it. Then I seen it on Twitter on literally Saturday. And people are like, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, Eva Lisa's great. It was uh, her, her house burned down. She was on social media and she was complaining that her house burned down. I'm like, okay. And let me stop it right there. She's complaining that her house burned down. She had a bad year. Everybody had a bad year. But you show up to work. Everybody expects you to show up to work and do your job. Nobody, I'm not saying nobody can feel bad about Eva Lise and her house burning down and her going through a bunch of mental problems. It is what it is, right? You're going to take care of that and there's going to be fan support for you no matter what. But you have to show up to work. You can't let what happens in your personal life defeat you at, at your job. You're in the ring with a world champion in Thunder Rosa, okay? You have an attitude problem that's been well documented throughout the industry, and it's one of the reasons why WWE has not looked at you since you were there. You went to Lucha Underground, you did what you did, you got problems there with the women. Now you're in AEW, you finally have an opportunity to be a face of this division, legitimately a face of this division. This may be the only chance that you got, and you're going to do what you did, against Thunder Rosa and no sell or just kind of go in there nonchalantly and stiff Thunder Rosa and no sell Thunder Rosa's offense. You know, if I'm Tony Khan and I'm looking at this, that's deduction of points right there. You don't want to be doing that. Don't fuck up an opportunity here with AEW. She has an opportunity to really be a face of this division, Jesse, and I don't know if you've seen the gift that I'm talking about, but what do you think of Eva Lise potentially ruining, ruining her one final chance in North America with one of the major promotions. See, I still to the second haven't seen the gift, but I heard I heard the story. So what I did was I went back and watched that match in complete detail. Did you go back and watch the match? Uh, no, I didn't watch the match. I just uh, I, I I seen how stiff they were when it happened, but I just missed that one spot, and that one spot kind of threw me off for the rest of the match. When we when we get when we get done there before we hang up we're gonna go back and watch that match together. But let me tell you what I saw. Thunder Rosa was no selling the whole match. Here's here's what happened. Thunder Rosa did not want to go on defense. She didn't want to sell anything that Evilise did. Every time that Evilise tried to go on offense, Thunder Rosa went for um, a reversal. She had to go back on. She had to go back on offense and cut off her momentum. I mean, if you know how a match is produced in the ring between wrestlers, go back and watch it. I know you do, but I'm talking to other people in chat. Go back and watch it. Evil East did not get a shot at getting any kind of offense, and every time she did one offensive re uh, maneuver. And then she tried to go into the set of getting offense in. The next spot was a reversal. Thunder Rosa wanted to be on offense for the entire match. And by the time they get down to Eva Lee, and when she no sell no sold that spot, she was frustrated and tired of having to stay on defense for the whole match. And, and even if you listen to commentary, you'll even hear Ross and everybody else say, Wow, look at the back and forth in this match. That's because every single time that Eva Lee tried to put an offensive spot together, Thunder Rosa had to counter it and get out of it. She did not want to be the, uh, the NWA champion looking like she's selling for Evil E. She didn't want to sell at all, man. And I went back, I went back, I heard the story and I went back and legit watched it. No phone, no tablet. I just sit and watched it. And yeah, man, there was a legit no sell problem from Thunder Rosa. And what Evil East did was in retaliation. It's kind of like one of those things where the ref sees you in retaliation when someone else hit you first. You know, and go back and watch. Go back and watch that whole match. Thunder Rosa was not being a team player in that match. She didn't want to look bad in any way. Well, I don't know. It? I would have to go back and watch what you're talking about because I didn't notice that initially, but I, uh, I noticed how stiff they were, and then I noticed after the fact, three days later, about the snap neckmare that Ivelisse no sold. Um, if that is the case, then maybe Ivelisse was doing it as a retaliation of sorts to get back at Thunder Rosa. You may be correct in that. Or maybe... Right. You know, going into this thing well before this match was even planned for last week, maybe it has something to do with their prior relationship in Lucha Underground. Maybe they didn't like each other dating back to the Lucha Underground days because Eva Lise was in Lucha Underground. Thunder Rose was in Lucha Underground as Cobra Moon, and she was the leader of the, rep the reptile tribe in Lucha Underground. So I don't know if there was an issue there backstage or an issue on screen there. 
I don't know. See, I don't know. I don't know about that either. But the story that I heard and the reason I went back and watched it, the headline I heard was Thunder Rosa was no selling the match. And that's what I went back and looked for. So I went back and looked with an objective eye. And yeah, there was no. And you can see Thunder Rosa get her offense in and evilly sold for it, sold for a little bit. And then when it was time to, you know, for for her comeback, she stomped it out every time. Thunder Rosa stomped it out every time. She didn't want Eva Lee to get a single span of offense. Even during the commercial break, I watched during the commercial break, man. It was quite sad. Well, who produced the match then? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It looks like they called it all in the ring, other than like the other than like the opening and the go home segment. Because it was all it was all Thunder Rosa countering, counter, counter, and even commentary. Wow, this is back and forth. Because Thunder Rosa countered every damn thing, every like, three like at least three times commentary. Wow, this match is going back and forth. Because they started noticing like, wow, everything, every comeback is stumped out by Thunder Rosa. Dude, Evely started getting frustrated with that shit. You can tell. So he, he started getting stiffer and stiffer, and you can see the frustration grow throughout the match. So interesting. I, kinda, I gotta, I, I gotta, wa- I gotta watch it on demand. Then I got TNT on demand. I gotta go back and watch last week's. I gotta watch that match for last week. That's yeah, a, it's a, interesting. Very interesting. It's just, I, I could see not noticing it live, but when when the report comes up and you go look at it, absolutely, I agree that Thunder Rosa no sold that whole match for Evil East, man. Well, it was it was like night and day compared to last week. This was a lot a lot better than uh, than what yeah. we got last week. I, I think everybody was on the. The same page here. This was a very good tag team match for the 10 minutes that it was. Uh, yeah. There was no bullshit here. There was no... I mean, there was a stiff shot here and there. I was keeping a very close eye on how Thunder Rolls and Eva Lee would play out when they were in the ring together. There was some... There was a cheap shot here and there, but it was it was nothing like it was last week. But Hikaru Shida and Thunder Rosa is the story here. Eva Lee and Diamante, they won that tag team tournament. So they are the, uh, the winners of that women's tag team tournament that they had a couple of weeks back. But... Sheeta and Rosa win here. Rosa mistakenly gave uh, Sheeta, or, or uh, Sheeta gave Rosa a high knee, I believe, when Ivelisse moved out of the way. Rosa then saved Sheeta from a cover uh, several moments later. Rosa gave Diamante a Death Valley driver. Sheeta moved in and delivered a Falcon Arrow for a two count that was breaking up, uh, broken up by Ivelisse. And then Sheeta then finished Diamante off with a running boot. And that was it. Sheeta and Rosa win in about 10 minutes. Uh, when are we going to get this match between Rosa and Sheeta? You know it's happening again. Is it going to happen on an AEW show, possibly at their anniversary show? Or do you possibly... I know the NWA is back. They're doing, like, weekly pay-per-views, I believe. I don't know if you know anything about that. I don't know much yeah. about it, but I see Nick Aldis tweeting about it a couple of weeks back. Is it going to happen on an AEW anniversary show? Or is it maybe going to happen at an NWA show where Thunder Rosa gets her win back over Sheeta on an NWA show that so she doesn't have to lose on AEW TV. Either way, uh, it, it's about time for AEW to give back for lending us their, you know, phenomenal female talent. So if nothing else, I can see Sheeta doing a run-in and attacking Thunder Rosa at an NWA show to, um, to promote their AEW match, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. You know, that that would make a lot of sense. Um, and, I mean, again, once that happens, it'll be all over the Internet. It'll be all over YouTube. Everybody will see it. You don't have to have a camera crew there. So it will be seen. And, yeah, if the match has to be on AEW television because more eyes will be on it, it'll be smart to have Sheeta do a run-in or something like that on, on NWA TV. But if that's not the case, then, yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with uh, sending Sheeta out to, to headline a match with Thunder Rosa on, on NWA TV. It's more eyes on the product for both companies. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really liking Thunder Rosa in AEW. I think it's a nice bridge. Uh, someone was asking me earlier, do I think uh, Tony Khan should buy NWA? I don't think he needs to. I think no. a working relationship between the two is just fine if both parties want to work together. I think there's plenty mm-hmm. of talent that they could exchange back and forth. Uh, I don't think anybody needs to put anybody else out of business. But, no. you know, Rosa Rosa getting her win back, I'm I'm all for it. Sheeta's been so dominant for so long, I don't think a loss to Thunder Rosa is going to do anything to, to Hikaru Sheeta. So I'm all for it. Uh, yeah, it, it should be. And buying NWA, no. Uh, it, the, the system is better this way. It can be two different companies that still work together. 
So if, if you're aspiring to get in AEW and you can't quite get there, you might get a shot at getting in NWA. And if you're there performing, you will be seen by Tony Khan, and that might be your way into AEW. So. Yep, absolutely. Jericho. Jericho was interviewed by Dasha. And Jericho was asked about the Isaiah Cassidy challenge. Jericho said he respects him for what he said because it showed that Isaiah Cassidy has balls. He said someday he'll be a big star in AEW, but not next week because next week he's facing the million viewer man, the demo god, Chris Jericho. Then MJF entered the picture and said he heard what went down and the fact that that runt would disrespect him like that is deplorable. Jericho tattered MJF and says it means so much coming from him. MJF then imitated Jericho and called him the demo god and how much it means to him. Jericho said MJF is pretty great. They exchanged several, no, 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 you're great. No, 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 you're great. And then in sync, they asked why they called each other a loser last week. MJF said he saw it on Twitter and Instagram. He saw it on Reddit. Jericho says he saw it on Dynamite with his own eyes. A million fucking people watched. Uh, you know, a million people watched. You call me a loser. So MJF said he was calling the limo drivers a loser because they almost hit each other when they parked the vehicles nose to nose, face to face. So I loved MJF bringing the limo drivers in on this thing and him deflecting, calling Jericho a loser to the limo drivers and called them a loser. Jericho bought it. I was ready to call this shit out right away, too. I was ready to, and they already touched on it. I liked it. He said he wasn't calling MJF a loser either. He said he was aiming the comment at Shivani. They made fun of Tony together, and Jericho said, you know what, Max? You're all right. And Max returned the compliment, and they thanked Dasha and left. And no losers or no derogatory statements made to each other. This was one of the best segments of the night. They deserve their own comedy sitcom on TNT. I'd watch it every week, and so would a million other people. But yeah. they're fucking great. We all know that. Is this leading to anything? What do you think this is leading to? Or, or is this just AEW using two of the best guys in the business on the microphone for some really great promo shit, and that's it? They uh, they, they had MJF say that he needed, to, he needed to be in a faction. He mm -hmm. needed to... Be in a group, and now he's flirting with Jericho. But see, Jericho or Moxley, neither one of those guys would would, would answer to anyone. So maybe the maybe Inner Circle becomes a a, a two headed monster led by Jericho and Moxley, uh, and Moxley and MJF. I don't know. I don't know. Very interesting. I, I'm still waiting for uh, MJF, who was robbed of the AEW title, to uh, get his comeuppance here. So we'll he was see. cheated. Say again? He, he was cheated. I know. He was cheated. He was cheated. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. But, uh, again, just tremendous stuff by both of these guys. They're always uh, a treat to see on a two-hour Dynamite, especially when they're together. AEW hype next week's show. Jericho versus Cassidy. FTR versus SCU. Ricky Starks versus Darby Allen one-on-one. -on -one. John Moxley appears as well. So, they're loading next week's Dynamite up, as always. I'm looking forward very much to that Ricky Starks, Darby Allen match on next week's Dynamite. And they're pre-taping next week's show tomorrow, so they can't do anything with uh, whatever they missed out on yet. Lance Archer and the six-man tag with Moxley and Brian Cage. I'm assuming that will happen eventually when Lance Archer is okay, but they are taping Next week's show tomorrow at Daly's Place, so it should be a good one. In the main event, John Moxley versus Eddie Kingston, AEW World Title Match. These two have a lot of history. Eddie Kingston, 18 years. This is probably going back to the CZW days of John Moxley. Eddie Kingston getting a title match because he was not eliminated from the Battle Royal at the pay-per-view All Out. And I was looking forward to this to see how these guys would mesh, and they actually started off... Quite slow, um, just giving giving everybody a change of pace because everybody knows them to be uh, just, you know, brawlers. And, you know, everybody expected the blood to be shed quite early here. But they had a brawl. It was intense. It was very good. Traded some knife-edge chops. Moxley's chest was beat red at the end of this thing. Eddie Kingston himself looked beat up. He had a huge fucking bruise on the left side of his back. You've seen it just kind of protruding out of his 
of his singlet. So Eddie Kingston was in control for a little bit. They were trading shops back and forth, strikes back and forth. We went to commercial break. He was beating on Moxley during the commercial break. Moxley made a comeback with a tope and a pile driver for a near fall. Kingston hit a power bomb for a two count. Kingston sold like he might have injured himself, but he's damn good at what he does. Moxley avoided two back fists and used a bulldog choke for a submission victory over Mr. Eddie Kingston here. 11 minutes in the main event. Sleeper hold and then a bulldog choke and Kingston passed out. The referee was quick to call for the bell. Afterwards, the Lucha Brothers ran out and attacked Moxley. Will Hobbs ran out for the save. He ended up, you know, taking out the Lucha Brothers. I believe he gave one of them a fucking unbelievable spine buster. Darby Allen ran out with his theme music. I don't know why. I don't know why he just doesn't come riding out on the skateboard. I don't know. I don't understand the reason for his theme music to hit for like three fucking seconds. Anyway, he came, he came out with the skateboard in hand, made the save. He cleared the ring. Ricky Starks came out and absolutely speared Darby Allen in half. And he nailed him right on his fucking head. Darby Allen sold this shit so hard, he almost fucking killed himself. Landed on, his, on the back of his neck. Taz walked out to ringside with Ricky Starks right now. Lucha Brothers, Starks, and Kingston beat up on Darby, Hobbs, and Moxley. Starks used the skateboard on Allen. And the show ended with Kingston sitting above a downed John Moxley. We may be shifting into another six-man tag. Never mind the original match that we got. That's the match that we might be getting uh, in the weeks to come, being that Lance Archer has uh, COVID, and more than likely, Brian Cage is home in quarantine right now because of this thing. Uh, Jesse, what'd you think of this match? Uh, what'd you think of the plan B with Moxley and Eddie Kingston? Did it deliver for an AEW title match on Dynamite tonight? And where do you see all this going leading into the weeks to come? It, it, it's it's got to be a little confusing, you know, with Lancia, you know, uh, uh, Archer getting um getting hurt and all with hurt with COVID. Um, what does this do about Jake? And is was Jake exposed? That's a good question. I'm sure he's uh, I'm sure he's home too. You know, you know it's uh, I'm not worried about Lance Archer getting it, but I am worried about Jake Roberts getting it. Yeah, yeah. Nothing was made about that. I know, like I said before earlier in the show, Archer t- tweeted out saying that he was fine. And uh, he actually, I have it queued up here. Let me see. He said on Twitter, when I returned from our last show, a family member was ill when I got home. I found out later a friend who had taken my family member to the vet uh, had COVID and tested positive while at home. Now, I also got sick, tested positive. I feel okay. And you'll see me in two weeks. So that's, that's all he said. Tony Khan announced the change on, uh, on Dynamite on Twitter. And it seems to be that we may be rerouting to a different six-man tag. And whatever the case may be, I'm just I'm just very interested to see what Will Hobbs does in his in his dynamite, you know, debut. I want to see what he does there. I'm just I've already, I've already seen him wrestle, and I'm not that much interested in seeing him wrestle in a match right now. I'm interested in him and his character to see where they go with it and see what kind of arc it takes. Because obviously he just can't stay like this, just a happy-go-lucky guy who likes to wrestle. I mean, that's... I want to see where they go with it. You know, does he turn into a super badass baby face? Does he turn heel? What does he do? You know, he's good in the ring. I'm not, I'm not here to question his in-ring a bit. I've seen him work, so that's, 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 that's a box checked. He's fine. Yeah. So, what else? That, I mean, honestly, I, I mean, putting him in a match... I, I can't get excited for it because I know what he does. I know I'm not going to be excited about it because it's nice, but it's just a little boring. I want to see him in some promos. I want to see him in some story arcs. I want to see what else they do with him. Yeah. So. Anyway, man, that is the uh, that was the end of the review. That is the end of Dynamite today. Uh, good show, and uh, it flowed very nicely. Uh, it kept you on your toes. You know, always a good show from yeah. AEW. Uh, I will be watching NXT probably tomorrow, and I'll be live with the with the live stream tomorrow afternoon at some point. I'll let you guys know on on social media. Uh, some big time matches coming out of that number one contender match for the women's title over there, and uh, whoever is going to be going one on one with Finn Balor at Takeover, that's going to be determined as well. Which I already know the winner because people are a bunch of assholes. But we will uh, talk about that tomorrow. But if you guys want to hang around, Jesse and I are going to run through some Super Chats here. So hang around. If you guys are done with the review, I will see you tomorrow as we talk NXT. 
And if you guys want to hang around, we're going to be taking some super chats right now. They are open. So thank you guys for sticking with me. Hit that thumbs up. Let's get to 500 likes in the chat, please. I would greatly appreciate it. I really don't know why people are here 1,100 all night. We only have 483 likes. You guys need to do better on that, man. Seriously. It helps out. They turn, they turn heel on you, man. Yeah, they turn heel on me. You guys don't understand how, how it helps out the channel, man. So hit that thumbs up. Let's get it to 500 now before we get to the Super Chats, man. Follow us on Twitter. You guys see the Twitter profiles there on screen. And if you missed anything on the channel, links are down below for all the videos that are on the channel right now. Let's hit these up, man. Popo Jr., $5 Super Chat. Eddie fucking Kingston, man. I can't get enough of him on the mic. Also shows how bad the women's division is showing the same women every week. Eddie Kingston's always been great on the microphone. And it also shows how bad the women's division is. I don't know what you mean by that, Popo. Women's division actually is getting a little bit better on AEW. I really can't say anything negatively about it right now because where we were months ago to where we are now, it don't even look like the same division, bro. And you can thank Thunder Rosa for that. She's not even an AEW employee full-time. JP5150, $10 Super Chat. Enjoying the OTS Source of Truth podcast with a homemade pumpkin spice latte. Sounds good, bro. Also said about Roe Royer Animal, rest in peace, LOD will meet you in the sky one day. AEW, despite last minute change, was good. I absolutely... Get the cursor off of me. Get the cursor off of you. I'm sorry. God. JP, thank you for the $10 super chat, man. I appreciate you. Gregory Benson, 999. What is up, everybody? Dynamite was good tonight. Listening to the podcast while eating pizza. Or watching a pizza. I wish I was eating a pizza. I love pizza. Watching a pizza cook-off on Guy's Grocery Games over on the Food Network. That sounds good, man. They might re they might be rerunning that one back when I lay down on the couch a little bit later. I appreciate you, man. $9.99. Thank you for the $10. Pedro W with a Canadian 20. JD, being that you love craft beer, if you ever get a chance after all this pandemic stuff goes away, make your way over to Niagara on the lake in Canada and I'll get you a round of beers. We are the kings of craft beer. Bro, I was going to do that this summer, but the border wasn't open. The border wasn't open. So I visited the falls on the New York side. Still beautiful, but I wanted to visit the Canada side. But I will uh, I will definitely take you up on that offer, man, when that time comes. Thank you for the Canadian 20. Gregory Benson, a 499 Super Chat. Even on Wednesday night, Guy Fieri is still the man. Of course he is. He's the real demo god. He's the real million viewer man. You don't fuck with Guy, bro. 64 Panned Q, 499. So glad I stopped watching that WWE. Hot Cross. Titus Catering. Buns joke of a show. And became an AEW guy. OTS number one. Here's five on me. I appreciate you, 64. I don't know what the hell you were saying, but I appreciate you. Titus got his ass kicked by Retribution, man. They didn't like the asparagus over the green beans and catering is what I heard. Slapcock, mage, and who? Laughing my ass off. A botched debut. Bro, I'm so sick of Retribution, man. I'm fucking sick of talking about him. Well, yeah, that was another thing. It was um, Hardy's attacker was um, also probably Retribution, too. Yeah. So. Instead, if they were booked on AEW, they wouldn't have uh, t names like T-Bar oh, and Mace and Slapjack. Slap nuts. Bro, do you know what the do you know what the Urban Dictionary definition of Slapjack means? Um, God, isn't it like a little stick? Uh, no, I'm gonna read it to you right now. Sal Rex sent it to me. Uh, slapjack is the art of ejaculating on one's hand and then slapping another person in the face. Oh, that's awesome. They even use the definition. They even use the definition in a sentence, too. Today, I gave Melinda a slapjack after that bitch ate the last Hot Pocket. Oh, my God. That's what... Okay. That guy has the greatest name in wrestling now. 
T-Bar, listen to this one, T-Bar. When one is wearing a thong, they sit down, it sticks out, and you see a T-Bar. They use it in a sentence too. Johnny, Johnny, look over there, no. it's a T-Bar. No, that's a whale tail. <laughs> that's a whale tail. <laughs> oh, man. That's what false. A Bro, the, the, the real news story is, if that is the true definition of, of a slapjack, a, who, who knew about that in WWE enough to give them that name? And B, why, 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 why do it? Why Nobody. do it? They didn't know about the sorority sisters when they named the, the women that and it turns out to be a poor damn site. T-Bar, T-Rex, T-Virus. Flapjack, that is awesome. You get the jizz in somebody's hand and slap them with the very same hand. And my wife's want to fucking name him T-Bag at that point. Man, how awesome is that? I don't he know. gets no lower than that. He damn. Bro, Slapjack is going to be the next WrestleMania main event, bro. My God. WWE Slapjack this Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Cake with a $2 super chat. Glad to see the real Cody Rhodes back. Brody was nerfed. I don't think he was nerfed, bro. Brody is uh, kicking ass right now. Drizzy Drew with a 499 Super Chat. If you guys didn't see Late Night Dynamite, the Ben Carter Scorpio Sky match burned the house down. They should sign Carter. The guy got hella talent. I don't know. Listen, everybody's talking about this Ben Carter. I got I to gotta see what this guy did. Did you watch Late Night Dynamite? No. No. Neither did I. Might have to go back on demand and watch it. Uh, I did not uh, have any interest in watching it last night, but... Everybody's saying that it was a damn good show. It did 600,000 viewers in the time slot that it that was in. That's what I heard. It's not that I didn't want to watch it. I legit forgot about it. So I got to go back and watch yeah. it. Yeah. I will check out that Ben Carter match, man. Everybody's talking about him. If everybody's talking about him, I got to look at him. I got to see what he's all about. Mr. Premium, 2002, 999. The Road Warriors were the best of the best. I don't usually tear up about celebrity deaths, but I'm not afraid to admit this one got me. Thank you for your wrestling coverage as always. Mr. Premium. I appreciate you, bro. It'll be good. It'll be all right. You know? They all get to me, man. I want, at some point, they all get to me, you know? Yeah. yeah. Fucking uh, Bobby Heenan got to me. Fink got to me. Uh, mean Gene got to me. You know, those guys are voices of my childhood, man. When I have kids and I show them professional wrestling, those are going to be the voices that I show them. Everybody. Yeah. You know, Legion of Doom are going to be tag teams. I show them. Gregory Benson with a 999 Super Chat. JD just called the Retribution members by their actual names. Dio Madden, Dominic Dijakovic, Mia Yim, Mercedes Martinez, and Shane Thorne, and not their stupid made-up cosplay names. Oh, I will. But that's not going to stop me from shitting on the names that WWE gave them. I got to shit on the names, which I believe was done on purpose. Check. Dan Tower became a new member. Thank you so much, brother. Zephyr the Scribe. What's up, guys? Been watching for five years. Not that AEW needs it, but do you think Dario Cueto would make a cool GM on Dynamite? Dario Cueto was the best on-screen GM in the business when Lucha Underground was a thing. No, he would not be over in w on Dynamite. No, he would not be the same. Yeah, I agree with Jess. He would not be the same Dario Cueto we'd say. Dario Cueto was such a great character because of the way Lucha Underground was filmed. And, yeah, and it was Lucha Underground. The language barrier would, would, would be a hindrance for him yeah. over here. Yeah, and remember, you know, he was an actor who, I guess you consider, you can consider that with whoever you see on TV now, but I don't, I don't know if he was in the wrestling business before he got cast to play Dario Cueto. So, no, no. I, I don't know, I don't know his background, but again, that character was made because of the way the show was shot. And the yeah, leniency so that they good, had. Dude. Yeah, he was great. And Matanza, Jeff Cobb oh, yeah. playing Matanza, he was, the, man, you talk about fucking big men and dominating he, fucking figures, That's that was perfect. Doesn't Cobb start here soon? Uh, Cobb signed with New Japan, I believe. Oh, I, I thought he had a, a deal here of AEW too as well. Um, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Dan Tower to five dollar UK. Hey JD, love your work, brother. Do you think that AEW will do any work with some of the UK wrestling companies, and would you and would love to do a show with you? I appreciate that, Dan. Um, 
WWE owns the UK at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, I think WWE pretty much has a uh, lock and key on most of the UK promotions out there, man. That's why NXT UK is a thing. They wanted to monopolize all that region. You yeah. know, the British strong style was so hot, and WWE picked up on it, and Triple H literally took over. Um, but as far as doing a show with anybody, man, I don't really do a show with uh, anybody but Jesse here on Wednesday nights. Which is on my channel. I've uh, I've strayed away from working with people, bro. You know, people are quick to stab you in the back, and that's just the way of life in the community, man. But I appreciate you, Dan. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, Indigo, two dollar super chat. AJD and Jesse, much respect. Love you, Indigo. Thank you so much, man. Frankie, six five one five dollar super chat. I think it's too early to feud Cody and Brody Lee again. What's that about? I had to work, so I missed it. JD, Jesse, OTS are the best in the IWC. Thank you so much, man. Uh, you think it's too early for them to feud again, Jesse? And uh, what do you think about that? I, don't lie. I thought Cody would be out a little bit longer than this. Um, I could see this this being a little a little quick to bring him back. And, and that's why it feels like they kind of booked into a corner. Because for the beating he gave Cody, uh, this run can't be just five weeks. No. So he, I mean, he's going to either have to beat him again or it's a bad idea to have him lose because it's five weeks is not long enough. Yeah. So now, now I wouldn't have a problem with Cody winning if he was out like a good half a year or something like that. But he was gone a little over a month. So he's got to lose. Frankie, thank you for the super chat, brother. Steven Vandelli, what is up, my man? Uh, I love you, my brothers, but I can clearly see we will never agree on Abaddon. You are still the greatest tag team in the IWC. Abaddon may be, uh, may be getting a title shot sooner rather than later, bro. I don't know. Abaddon is a waste of space and money right now. There you go, Vandelli. I don't know what to tell you, man. Jesse's not a fan. As of right now, look, as of right now, no. It's not going to work. And, it, and look, it's not just me thinking that because if it was going to work, they brought her up, they put her on TV and they put her back down and they've done nothing with her. They see what I see. It's it, it's not her time yet. Man, uh, you listen, um, like I told you before, that, that character has such a small ceiling. I don't know what they got to do to fucking bring that thing back down to earth. Uh, even if she's yeah. in the ring with Sheeta, I can't see her beating Sheeta, you know? Yeah, yeah. At first, I mean, first and foremost, she needs a mouthpiece. First yep. and foremost. And then she can clean up in the ring a little bit because she is a little sloppy. But that can be worked around with a good mouthpiece, though. Yeah. My brother, Osoque Vasquez. Became a new member, brother. Thank you so much, man. I hope you and the family are doing incredibly well, man. And I hope that you're still doing your thing. Love to see passionate people become a part of the community, man. Harold Jones as well with a membership, man. We got three new members tonight. Thank you guys so very much, man. Laura Conway, 299. Thank you for the super chat, Laura. Dr. Glorious with a Canadian $2. I'd rather watch Riho versus Brandy Rhodes than watch Raw. Bro, Raw is the worst show on television. Brian Alvarez went in on Raw, man. Holy shit. <laughs> Fucking funny, yeah. man. Fucking hilarious. Brian Alvarez shitting on Raw. He also says, imagine a kid asking his dad that he wants an autograph from T-Bar and Slapjack. LOL. Could Chris Jericho become the first AEW Hall of Famer? Also, Evil Uno lost a lot of weight compared to last year. Absolutely. I, I love Evil Uno. I'll say that over and over again. I think him and Stu Grayson yeah. are fucking phenomenal. Uh, Jericho being an AEW Hall of Famer. Um, AEW doesn't need a Hall of Fame right now. Period. Jericho will be a WWE Hall of Famer before an yeah. AEW Hall of Famer. And uh, again, T-Bar and Slapjack, bro. I don't know. Dominic Dijakovic disabled comments on his Twitter account because he was getting so much shit. But it's not even his fault. It's not even his fault. Blame, blame, blame Bruce. God. Yeah, it, you know, um, when AEW is ready for Hall of Fame, pretty much everybody you're seeing highlighted and profiled on TV right now will all make it in because we're talking down the road and the guys you see right now are in on the, on the ground level so yeah they would they would have helped build the, the foundation which AEW needs to grow into when they start making a hall of fame yep 
Dried chicken without flavor, $3.99 Super Chat. Do you watch New Japan? I do not, brother. I know the G1's going on. I know there are people in the community who do the same thing I do that uh, love the G1. I will not be watching the G1. WWE sucks the life out of me, and AEW gets the remains. So, that's that. Luis Baez, 1999 Super Chat, man. Thank you so much, brother. What's up, JD and Jesse? First off, wanted to say rest in peace, Road Warrior Animal. What a legend. When I seen that NXT was on, I totally forgot about that. Plus, great and hilarious back and forth by MJF and Jericho. Absolutely, man. Rest in peace, Road Warrior Animal. Uh, NXT. I got to watch it this week. I missed last week because I opted not to watch just out of me not caring, but... MJF and Jericho, two of the best in the business on the microphone. Thank you so much for the $20, brother. Really appreciate it. Screeching War Beef, $5 Super Chat. AJ, they sent you money for the beer I owe you from Twitch earlier today. Keep up the great work and enjoy your Guinness draw. Screeching War Beef, you fucking beast, man. I got it. Thank you so much, man. That's for me hitting four birdies in a row on PGA 2K21. If you guys are not following me on Twitch, man, I don't know what you're doing. Fucking hipster, man. I gotta play golf, man. I'm gonna learn real, real golf sooner rather than later. AWS Promotions, $3.99. This is for you, Jesse, and the Britt Baker Fund. Thank you, man. I got a nice little bank here in the apartment for the uh, Britt Baker Jesse Fund. Baker's gonna ban me on Twitter to no fault of mine. Oh, just like uh, Zelina Vega banned me, right? Bench me? No, you were an asshole. No, you I deserved wasn't. it. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I was not an asshole to Britt Baker. She doesn't belong in that title picture. Uh-huh. She can bench me fucking a thousand times over. I'm right. No, she doesn't I'm belong right. in the title picture. I'm right. Yes, okay. But she's And now she's wrestler. on the pre-show. She's not a bad wrestler, though. And now the match is on the pre-show. Now Oscar's yeah. on the pre-show. After all they did to give Oscar that championship back against Sasha Oscar's Bailey, Oscar's on, on the pre-show. pre-show. Oscar's on the pre-show. She's, she's not ready for this match. Not at all. Who? Zelina Vega. Of course Oscar. Not. What the fuck do you mean? Who? <laughs> <laughs> Oscar doesn't want to be ready for the match because she knows she shouldn't be in the match. She shouldn't, shouldn't be in the match. Yeah. Magician Sapphire, man. Thank you for the super chat. We got a $10 super chat here. Eddie Kingston is quickly showing why he's one of the best pickups for AEW. The man is gold. Damn good on the microphone, man. Love him. Three ninety nine panned Q. These Urban Dictionary names. Oh, my gosh. Kal-El. A $5 super chat. AJD, did anyone that block you as a WWE performer unblock you when they were not a WWE performer? No. 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 And you don't re- really remember who you block. You block people, and then like a year or two later, you don't fucking go back no. and look at your block list. It's just it's blocked. No. Oh. oh, my God. Those greens with a four ninety nine super chat. When do you think the Four Horsemen faction starts? The longer the better, man. I'm not really I'm not really too keen on it getting started now. I want things to be a little bit more normal before anything, honestly. Jesse, what do you think? Oh, what? I wasn't paying attention. Uh, about a Four Horsemen group in, in AEW. <laughs> it's... It, uh... They have to make some kind of sense of it. It feels like if they form the Four Horsemen group right now, it, it, it would feel kind of random. Because they they kind of just like they kind of showcase like about six or seven of different people who could all be in the four horsemen right now, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't I don't know. They gotta kind of make some. Remember what we said earlier about everybody being kind of like in a limbo state and a transition state. I'm not sure where they're going. Everybody's talking about FTR being in the horsemen. Well, that's two already gone. But now if they're talking about Hangman, that's three. Who's the fourth? And forget everybody else that was rumored. You know, I don't know. It can kind of be too soon right about now. And that's pretty much it, guys. That is all the Super Chats. That is AEW. That's Dynamite. That's all the news coming out of Dynamite and AEW. And we are about to get out of here. Jesse, any parting words before we get the hell out of here? No, man. No, no, no. I can't wait to um, watch NXT. You can't wait to not watch NXT? Yeah, not watch NXT. Okay, there you go. I wish but I could I join you, you, but do, I got a job. To I do. want everybody else to do too. Go back to last week and watch the uh, Thunder Rosa versus Evil East match. I will certainly do that at some point. I got to see yeah. what the hell's going on there. But uh, guys, I appreciate all you stopping by, making us the number one show in the IWC as always on a Wednesday night. No matter who is in the community, man, 
is always, always number one here on Off The Script, no matter what. You look at the live section on YouTube, we're always number one. Why? You know why. Because we're the best of what we do. Follow us on Twitter, man. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. That is on Twitter and Instagram. If you missed the videos that I've uploaded this week, go and check it out down below in the description. Go and get your Harry's, man. I swear to God, if one or two of you guys go and get Harry's, man, it does me so good. Believe me. Harry's.com slash script. Go and get your trial set, shave set today. And their brand new razor blades, man. Harry's.com slash script. And if you guys want to support, Patreon. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Mouthmasker.com slash OTS via masks. And your t-shirts at bonfire.com. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that thumbs up. And I will see you guys tomorrow afternoon for NXT. Jesse and I will be back next week for Dynamite, man. I'm getting in the Mustang. Jesse's joining me. We got the windows down. We got this guitar solo coming up, blasting with the windows down. I'll see you, man. And I'll see you guys next week for AEW. Tell me, you're driving. No, you're not. I'm, I'm driving. You'll know how to drive. Bro, man. nobody gets behind the wheel of my Mustang, okay? Get out of here. I'll show you how to drive, man. I'll show you how to drive. See you guys later.